All right. Court is in session. Honorable Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers presiding. Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. Okay. Let's go ahead and go on the record. Calling Civil Action 20 5640 Epic Games Inc. versus Apple Inc. Council, please state your appearance. Good morning, Your Honor. Catherine Forrest for Epic. Good morning, Ms. Forrest. Good morning, Gary Bernstein for Epic. Mr. Bernstein, welcome back. Good morning, Jonathan Evans for Epic. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Lauren Moskowitz for Epic. Okay, good morning. Good morning, John Karen for Epic. John Karen. Karen, welcome to the courtroom. First time, right? Mr. Sweeney, good morning. Mr. Rudd, good morning. Good morning. Okay, on the Apple side, Mr. Good morning, Your Honor. Veronica Moyer for Apple. Good morning, Ms. Moyer. Good morning, Your Honor. Betty Yang for Apple. Welcome back. Good morning, Your Honor. Richard Dorn for Apple. And we're here with Kate Adams and Heather Gagnon. And of course, Mr. Schiller. Okay. Good morning to each of you. All right, Mr. Spaulding. It only took me three weeks to get the two of you right. All right, I see Ms. Dunn back there. Good morning. Who else do we have in the back? Um, Your Honor, we have our witness, Mr. Tim Cook. Mr. Cook, good morning. Um, uh, we have Ms. Dunn, Karen Dunn. We have Kyle Andrew from uh, Apple. We have Kate Kaysel Howard from Apple. And we have Lauren Dancy from Gibson Band also for Apple. Okay. Good morning to each of you. And let's see, we've got some additional folks in the gallery. So from the press, I'm not sure that we have Michael Acton from MLEX. Good morning, sir. And then Dorothy Acton from Law 360. Good morning. Uh, Betsy Manifold is back for the plaintiff's counsel. Good morning. All right, then I see some additional things. Yes, Your Honor, I can, uh, since they don't have mics, I can introduce them. Uh, we have Brent Byers, uh, who you remember from yesterday, uh, and Jessica Choi also uh, working with Mr. Byers on the witness, Lauren Cross, our beach master, uh, and then Justin Clark, one of our partners. Okay. Well, we're going a little bit extra on people today, but I'm going to uh, use my discretion and allow it. Thank you, Jan. Um, good morning, Ms. Derringer. Is our um, courtroom artist who is here as well. Okay, a few things to do before we get started. I have my list. Ms. Forrest, do you have a list of things to address? I, I do, Your Honor, and I have conferred with Mr. Doran on these. Uh, the first is just uh, on the timesheet that we were given this morning. Uh, I wanted to uh, confirm that we had, according to the court's numbers, two hours and 16 minutes left. That should be 13 more minutes should be deducted from that because we'll hand up now the final finding um, deposition designation binder. And when we added in some additional testimony from Mr. Gray, it's 13 minutes. So we actually have, I believe, two hours and three minutes. And Apple's counter designations to Mr. Gray were minor. They were 11 minutes. And so that uh, brings them down to six hours and 38. Okay. And with Agreed. the Agreed. Yes, Your Honor. And uh, we're prepared to hand up then the final binding binder of the deposition designation. Great. I'm glad I did not take it earlier. Let me just put them over there, Francis. Thank you. Okay, next. All right. The next is to um, then uh, confirm for Your Honor that the, or confirm with Your Honor, uh, that the expert direct uh, testimony has now, uh, we would move the admission uh, of all of it. Uh, we had, it had been provisionally admitted previously. Uh, we have two, AC and CRAG, where we are 
waiting for the final rulings, but subject to those final rulings, uh, we would move for the admission of all of the experts uh, on both sides. And, and Your Honor, obviously we're fine with that subject to the court's ruling. The only administrative matter is that the versions of our written directs before the court still have highlighting on them for that for which we're waiting for evidence, and we'd like to submit clean copies to the court um, either later today or over the weekend. But, but in, in terms of admission of the testimony, we have, we have no objection. Okay. Um, I believe that that was part of the last filing of last night. This is um, docket 725, which included additional exhibits and then, oh no, these were depots. Okay. So docket 725 is, um, is admitted just for purposes of the record because I've already updated my exhibit list. Um, With respect to, well, let me go back to the experts. In general, the request is fine, but I do want to, I, I do want to address something else with respect to their testimony. What else do you have? All right, uh, I have uh, three other just sort of uh, logistics and then one request. On logistics, uh, we've got the findings of fact that we've been giving to Your Honor yes. periodically. Uh, we were wondering whether or not we could have uh, a couple of extra days for the very final one so we could ensure that we've done a complete sort of site check. Uh, and if we could submit the final final on Friday of next week uh, or any other day that Your Honor would find acceptable, uh, we would appreciate that. We'll be, some people on our team will be traveling back to the East Coast, uh, which is why we had selected Friday. I think it, Mr. Dorn. Sure. Yes, Your Honor. In light of the travel, uh, we're fine with that. Uh, I think that that's fine. I don't. One of the reasons why uh, why I ordered that you do it, in addition to the suggestion from my colleague Jeff White, um, for whom I'll give credit. And if you have any complaints, you can come to me. If you want to give credit, you go to him. Um, is because I think it has been helpful, at least with respect to the parties, in terms of um, teasing out particular issues while we were here in trial so we could address them. At this point, uh, having them on uh, the 28th, which I think is a week from today, the finals is fine with me. Um, what I am going to do, though, it's the start of a long weekend, I'm going to order that you do them by uh, on Friday. That way, you're forced to get them done, and then you can take a break. Very much appreciated, Your Honor. Actually, we will uh, uh, noon our time. time, which is 3 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, very good. And then uh, two other logistics. Uh, we uh, believe it would be useful to have the parties confer and confirm the final list of admitted exhibits. Well, I wanted to do that today. Okay. So All right. I, I want us to be on the same page with respect to that. So I'm hoping that we will finish at a time. But again, I'd like to have some junior lawyers at the mics uh, and we'll go through my list. You let me know if you have something different. Um, but I also need to make sure Ms. Stone's on the same page, et cetera. So we'll do that this afternoon. That was on my list. Uh, the last logistic before the request is on trial transcripts to the extent there are typos uh, that are not, to, I wouldn't even call them typos, more that a name might be spelled differently or something of that nature that the court reporter might not have been able to anticipate. The parties could confer if there are any errata to be submitted to the court for approval. Uh, again by Friday. I'm not sure there will be any, but that would allow us not to, not to change testimony. It's really just to make sure we've got a clean transcript. So long as they're fixing names, spellings, and things like that, that's fine with me, Your Honor. Okay. I'm not gonna, going to ask the court reporters to go back and change their work. It'll just be on the docket for purposes of any appellate issues. Yes. And then lastly, Your Honor, Monday is the date for the uh, uh, closing uh, with the back and forth we've submitted an agenda. Uh, the cover note to the agenda uh, asked if the court had any particular issues that you wanted us to focus on, um, and if so, 
uh, we would appreciate very much any direction. There's sort of a long list. You may have more interest in some than in others, and uh, we would love to be able to focus appropriately. Yeah, it is an ambitious, um, it, it, it's an ambitious agenda. I don't think we are going to get through it. Um, I have a copy if it would be helpful to, to handle oh, I, I, I remember it. Um, and uh, the, I think um, remedies would be interesting to hear about. Uh, issues um, relating to uh, obviously the, the nature of the market. I don't need to hear too much with respect to um, Epic's approach in the sense that, well, I guess as as Professor Smolensy said, it's a tautology. Of course, they have a monopoly if it's their thing. So that doesn't need um, much argument. The question is whether I accept that argument or not. Um, it is uh, under the law, the exception, not the rule. It is the rare case, not the obvious case. So I don't know if you want to talk about whether this should be a rare case or not. Uh, Issues of substitutes, uh, I think, are are interesting uh, and will be something that I spend some time on. Uh, the lack of competition on the 30% is something that is troubling. Um, I don't put much weight on litigation moves. So, you know, I don't know that you want to spend a lot of time on those topics. Uh, this is a dynamic market. Things are changing rapidly. I have a snapshot. We are, we are at a point in time in a moving stream. So understanding what your perspectives would be for the court's role in that dynamic environment, that would be interesting to me. Um, those are questions that I might ask you if I wasn't uh, forecasting right now. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, there are a lot of facts that I've said. I have to go back and check um, whether there's any substanti substantiation uh, or some of the positions that are being asserted. And I haven't had the, haven't had the time to do that, obviously. Uh, those are the things that come to, to mind. Thank you, I would be, you know, I will let you all uh, drive the conversation. I will push you faster through topics which are of less concern, and I will spend more think, time with you on things that are, you know, that I'm debating right now in the back. But those are the things that come to mind right now. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Dorn, anything else from you? Nothing further, Your Honor. The, uh, the one thing I wanted to talk about, I'll circle back, Ms. Forrest, on the experts. Uh, with respect to CRAG, uh, the Spotify documents, uh, Microsoft, the Lori Wright testimony, and then I understand I have a brand new one on Professor Appy. I may not resolve those issues by Monday. Uh, and so what I would suggest 
is that I may end up resolving them in the context of a final order or as a, an adjunct to uh, the final order. I would suggest in your findings of fact and conclusions of law that if you don't have a ruling for me or from me, that you uh, give alternatives. That is, that you didn't, what you didn't prove if I choose to uh, strike it and what you did prove if I don't. Those things can be redacted. The testimony um, can be entered uh, given that these things are outstanding in a redacted form. And if I uh, allow it ultimately and you think it's important, then you can refile it in an unredacted form. But that way, at least we have the testimony in the docket and on the record. Uh, there is, um, I, I do want to put something on the record with respect to the sidebar that we had earlier in the week. I've only done one uh, because um, I said a couple of things to the two of you at sidebar that I think are equally relevant um, to the Spotify um, documents. And I want that in the record, but out of respect for your request for a sidebar, I'm just going to do that. Uh, that particular portion on the record under seal. We can do that at the end of the day. Uh, the rest I will do in written order. Okay. Very well. Thank you. All right. It is 8.15. Uh, apparently the media line is dead, so we are going to wait. It's driving in. Cameras outside, clearly not for me. <laughs> Although I wore a nice coat today. <laughs> it's now back on. Mr. Crick, come on up, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Apple Pie, Sister Tim Cook. This case now on trial should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you all. Okay. Thank you. Again, you just be sure that Mike is going to be the CEO of the case here. And then please stay before me on your last day. Okay, Mr. Cook, right. we can't hear you yet. Sorry again. Donald Cook, CEO, okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right, let me just double check that I've got that line. We have that line of working. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Cook. Good morning. But can I bring you some water? You may need some water during your testimony. Your Honor, can I coach you? Mr. Cook, what is your current role at Apple? Chief Executive Officer. And what are your responsibilities as Chief Executive Officer? The overall direction and strategy of the company. How long have you worked at Apple? Since 1998. And under what circumstances did you come to work at Apple? I was uh, working at Compact Computer at the time, and I got a call out of the blue that uh, Steve had come back to Apple and was essentially replacing the executive team. And he wanted to talk to me about being the operations chief. And are you referring to Mr. Steve Jobs? Yes, of course. What other positions have you held at Apple, Mr. Cook? Senior Vice President of Worldwide Operations. Uh, Executive Vice President of Sales and Operations and the Chief Operating Officer. And when did you become CEO? In 2011. What kind of oversight do you have over the after? Uh, it's limited, obviously, uh, in a review capacity is the way I would refer to it. Do you have um, a role with respect to strategic direction for the after? I have a role in strategic direction of the company, and so uh, to some degree, but more on a review basis. 
Can you describe for us, Mr. Cook, your education and employment history? Sure. Um, education is, I have a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering from Auburn University and a Master of Business Administration from Duke University. Uh, my career started at IBM. I worked there for about a dozen years uh, and then went to a small company called Intelligent Electronics in Denver for three years and then to Compaq for a very short period of time before joining Apple. And where did you grow up, Mr. Cook? In uh, Robertsdale, Alabama. Robertsdale, you said. Robertsdale. Mr. Cook, how would you describe Apple's mission? It's to make the best products in the world that really enrich people's lives. And what do you do to try and meet that mission? We do a number of things. We invest like crazy in uh, R&D. We've invested $100 billion since, uh, since the start of the iPhone development, and, and, and that number has just accelerated. And in fact, we've invested $50 billion in the last three years. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we have a maniacal focus on the user and doing the right thing by the customer. Uh, we integrate hardware, software, and services, and we think that we, we do that better than anyone else. Uh, we take a, a lot of the complexity of technology away from the user and make things simple, not, not complex. Thank you, sir. And what are the key commitments that Apple makes to its customers? Uh, simplicity, uh, safety, security, privacy, our key, uh, reliability, quality, um, you know, the things that make the best products in the world. And why does Apple focus on security, safety, and privacy in particular? Well, privacy from our point of view is, you know, one of the most important issues of the century. And safety and security are the foundation that privacy is built upon. And if you, if you look at what's happened today, technology uh, has the ability to sort of vacuum up all kinds of data from, from people. And uh, we, we like to provide people tools to, to circumvent that. And could you explain why do you believe privacy is one of the most important issues? I think that uh, in a world where you view that everybody's looking at your every move, you wind up doing less over time. And so it really it goes to our civil liberties as, as Americans, and uh, it really begins to affect your freedom of expression. How does Apple go about ensuring it meets its safety, security, and privacy commitments to its customers? Lots of investment, uh, a ton of R&D investment, obviously. Uh, we build it in from the ground up, and so it's a core part of our design process, not an add-on, sort of an after-the-fact kind of thing. And in the case of the, uh, the, case of the App Store, we review every app that uh, goes on the store. And why, sir, do you feel it's important to review every app that goes on the store? Because there can be malicious things that occur, uh, there can be things that, that uh, document people's uh, personal data. There can be uh, malware. You know, the, the list is, is pretty long of, of things that can happen. Are computer tools able to replace human assessment or app review in your view? I don't think so. You know, I think uh, it's important to have both. Uh, but today, the... Uh, uh, just like the advancements in machine learning, machine learning will not uh, address all of the issues in the app store. It still needs human judgment. Let's turn back to privacy for a moment. You mentioned its importance. Can you give us an example or two of how Apple has invested to improve customer privacy? Sure. Uh, just, just, just recently, we went live with application tracking transparency. Uh, where it puts the user in control of whether they're uh, being tracked across apps or not. Uh, we have a privacy nutrition label on the App Store, which is uh, sort of a, a simple at a glance way of seeing what data is being collected and what it's being used for, much like a nutrition label in the grocery store would tell you what, what is in, a, in some food and, and so forth. 
Uh, we also, several years ago, had intelligent tracking prevention, which looks at uh, um, the browsing traffic. And so you mentioned that um, APT app tracking transparency was just introduced. Yes. When was the privacy nutrition label introduced? It was introduced uh, last fall, I believe. What about IPP? I believe around uh, three to four years ago, so probably in 2017, the fall of 2017, I believe. How have developers responded to Apple's privacy initiatives? Uh, some uh, applauded and uh, some uh, are not happy with, with it. And what do you do when a developer disagrees with your policy initiative? Well, we listen. You know, we don't have a 10 year, but uh, we're making decisions in the best interest of the user. And I, I think it's important that, uh, that to know that sometimes there is a conflict between what the developer may want and what the user may want. And so in your experience, how have consumers responded to Apple's commitments to safety, security, and privacy? Overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the, the number of notes I get about the, um, the actions we're taking are, are truly, truly unbelievably positive. Do you also conduct consumer surveys uh, to get customer feedback on these issues? We do. And what do those surveys show? They would show that it's a very key factor, one of the top factors of why people choose Apple. Let's turn to the development of the iPhone and the App Store. Did Apple's safety, security, and privacy commitments impact development of the iPhone? Oh, of course. Uh, when we launched the iPhone in 2007, there wasn't an App Store. And so the, the way that you would have uh, put an app on the phone was using a web app in, instead of the, uh, using the App Store. And it wasn't until the following year that we figured out uh, that we could implement such a process of app review that would allow us to let native apps on there without having the security and safety and privacy issues that go along with that if you, if you do it without a review. How far did the iOS system for the iPhone compare to the pre-existing Mac OS system when the iPhone was introduced? Well, it was different. You know, the, the, of course, the Internet existed when the iPhone uh, was, was brought out, and so there was many more things you could do. But the, the, the iPhone was a different design point than the Mac, clearly. Uh, Mac was came out in 1984 uh, before much of the technology was available. And the use cases for the Mac obviously are different than that for a phone. You, you have a phone in your pocket or your pocket book um, most of the time, and you want instant service. And uh, so we felt that the, both the use cases and, and eventually the uh, threat profile would be much greater on the iPhone because of the number of iPhones that would exist in the market. And what steps did you take as a result of that view that the threat level would be higher for the iPhone? We created the app review process and, uh, and also put in an uh, enormous amount of effort in the safety, security, and privacy efforts on the phone, uh, including some of these things that I just talked about, like application tracking transparency and the privacy nutrition label, et cetera. And you mentioned uh, web apps in your earlier answer. Were web apps available when the iPhone was introduced? Yes. Were native apps, that is, apps that um, use the iOS software, could third parties uh, uh, produce native apps when the iPhone was introduced? Yes. And at what point was that capability added, if you can recall? It was one year uh, later in the, I believe it was the middle of 2008. And you referenced this earlier. Um, once Apple introduced that ability for third-party native apps, what steps did it take to ensure that it could continue to meet its commitments to its customers? Well, we put in app review. And so we reviewed every app that went on to the store. And this was a combination of tools and, and human review. 
because we care so deeply about the, the safety, security, and privacy for our customers. Is FPV effective at protecting iPhone users in your view? Yes. Do you have any data you can provide the court on the effectiveness level? Well, you can see in uh, third-party data that if you look at the malware that's on iOS versus Android versus Windows, uh, it's, it's literally uh, an off-the-chart level of difference. So hopefully that's come out sometime across the, the couple weeks here. So do you believe third parties can conduct app reviews for the iPhone as effectively as Apple can? No. And can you explain why not? Mr. Cook, what do you think the third party data shows you personally, the, the difference? It, it shows that the, um, that from a malware point of view, Your Honor, that there's about uh, one to 2% of the malware is on the iPhone versus around 30 to 40% on Android and another 30 to 40% on Windows. Okay. Go ahead. It's quite a difference. Um, Mr. Cook, we were talking about third parties, which the court just asked you about also. Do you believe, sir, or can you explain mm -hmm. why you believe third parties cannot conduct Apple view as effectively as Apple? I, I think they're not as motivated as Apple is. You know, for, for us, the customer is everything. And we're trying to give a customer an integrated solution of hardware, software, and services and deliver a brand promise of, of uh, privacy and security and safety. And so I, I just don't think you replicate that in a third party. So if a well-qualified third party said that they would commit to conduct a thorough review of apps for submission on the App Store, would you agree to that? No. Is that review, in your view, 100% effective at keeping problematic apps off the store? No, it's not 100%. It's not perfect. Uh, you, will, you will find mistakes being made. Uh, but in the, if you back up and look at it in the scheme of things, with 1.8 million or so apps on the store, we do a really good job. What step do you from time to time learn that there are problematic apps on the store? Sure, I'm, uh, I get lots of uh, reach out from the public and so forth. And if there's something on there, I do get a note from a developer or, or a customer some, many times direct to me. And I, I always forward it on quickly for action in the company. Let's look at, um, I believe the first document in your binder, that's PX0089. Yeah. So it's actually not the first document in the binder, it's further back. Course, Let me know when you have that document. I have it. And if you could look at the second page there. Yeah, I see it. And we see it looks like a note here to you from someone outside the company. That's correct. Right. And would you explain what that individual is conveying? Uh, he's making the point that our discovery is not as good as it should be, that we should improve it. What is the date on this document, sir? Uh, June 8, 2015. And if you would scroll up, you'll see a note from you. Yes. And who was that note written to? It's written to uh, Phil Schiller and Eddie Q. And your note is dated June 9, 2015, is that correct? That's correct. And what are you conveying in your note to them? Uh, that it is something that we need to improve upon. 
And sir, was there an effort made to make improvements as a result of this feedback meeting? Yes, definitely. We were, as a matter of fact, we were already working on a series of things, and that's what you see in the beginning of the matter. Your Honor, we'd like to move TX0089 into evidence. No objection? No objection, Your um, you said you were already in the midst of a program to improve by the time you received your feedback, is that correct? Yes. And could you describe what that effort was? It was, an, it was a, uh, if I'm looking at this thing right, we had a schedule that was going to time out in the fall and over 2016. Uh, that would bring a number of different discovery uh, features to the to the app store. Has Apple made other this interruption? Um, I have two binders, but they're identical. So somehow, and I don't know if he has two identical binders as well. But um, I'm helping the coach. You wouldn't see. Me. I only have one here, so I'm not sure what these are. I don't have the binder that that, you, that has uh, PX89 in it. Do we have another binder? Oh, I see it. I, I see it now. But it's only one binder? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry, I misdirected you. I think it was at the beginning. Um, we were talking about investments to improve the app store. You mentioned this um, enhancement for discovery. Has Apple made other investments to improve the app review process in the app store? Oh, many, many improvements over the course of the time since the app store launched in 2008. Have Apple's investments in research and development changed over time, Mr. Cook? Massively. Could you please um, take a look at the document DX4581 in your binder? And if you look at the page 3 of 70, it's BX4581.003. Could you identify this document for the record? It's our uh, 10K for the fiscal year 2020. We would like to move BX4581 into evidence. It's already in. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Yana. Does the Form 10-K contain information reporting on the level of research and development investment? It does. If you could turn to page 26, that's BX4581.02. And if we could blow up the research and development line under operating expenses, Mr. Cook, could you tell us how much did Apple invest in research and development in 2018? 14.2 billion. And how much did it invest in research and development in 2019? 16.2 billion. What was the percentage change in that investment between 2018 and 2019? 14%. Uh, and what was the level of investment in 2020? 18.8 billion. And what was the level of change in that investment between 2019 and 2020? 16%. Did the percentage of total net sales represented by that investment change from 2018 to 2020? Yes, it moved from 5% to 7%. Does that level of research and investment benefit the app store? Yes, of course. Did you allocate exactly how much? Uh, we don't allocate like that. Uh, we, instead of having, uh, you know, many spin outs throughout the company, we have one for the full company uh, to prevent 
sort of the debate back and forth about uh, how we allocate costs and also to run the company uh, in, in such a way that optimizes the total instead of optimizing the different divisions. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Before we leave the app review process though, I wanted to ask, does Apple do anything to protect consumers and developers after an app is published on the app store? Sure, I mean, we, we have uh, uh, great feedback that, that goes on uh, where we would know whether something is going right or not. Thank you, sir. Let's talk a little bit about Apple's commission rate. Has Apple's commission rate stayed the same over time? It, it's decreased. And can you describe those decreases for us? Sure. Uh, Maybe I should back up for a minute. About 85% of the apps on the App Store are free. Uh, so there's no, there, there's no commission charge for those because there's not uh, digital transactions going on. The rest of those are either 15 or 30%. The, the ones that are 15. Thanks are for providing the audio for, for us all to listen in and chat about. The initial subscription uh, uh, price of 30%. And there's a video partners program that it has a 15% rate. And then uh, most recently, we also uh, lowered the rate to 15% from 30 for developers that have uh, less than a, uh, one, $1 million of revenue per year. And that, that turns out to be the vast majority of developers. Um, when did the first start to consider the small business program that you just referenced, the most recent commission reduction? It probably has its origins uh, from several years ago. And why did Apple decide to implement that program then? What was in my mind at the time was I was very worried about COVID and the effect of COVID on uh, small businesses in particular. And did Apple consider litigation, regulatory issues when deciding to implement the small business program? It was, it was you know, things in my mind, sure. That was in the back of my mind. But the, but the primary reason was COVID. Does Apple consider litigation and regulatory issues when making our business decisions? Sure. What percentage, if you know, of developers on the App Store meet the criteria to pay the reduced 15% commission in the small business program? My, my recollection is that it's in the high 90s. And did you consider how the commission reduction in that small business program would impact revenue in the App Store? I think I saw an analysis at the time that uh, that estimated the, the reduction in revenue that would take part that would take place. Have competitors for the App Store responded to the commission reduction in the small business program? Yes. And how have they responded? Uh, I think Google also uh, lowered it to 15% for the developers underneath a uh, million dollars as, as one example. I'm not sure about other app stores. Have you gotten feedback from developers on the commission structure, the 15%, 30% commission structure? Sure. Uh, people uh, were universally pleased with the 30 to 15% move from small developers. And of course, I hear from some large developers that, that would like to pay less than 30. Let's talk a little about the App Store's impact. What has been the App Store's overall impact in your view, sir? I think it's been an economic miracle. Uh, when I think about the way it started with just 500 apps, and then now 1.8 million, uh, and the number of jobs that it's created in the United States, there, there's almost 2 million people in the U.S. that are around the iOS uh, job economy. And the level of commerce in the U.S. is 100 and $38 billion, according to one study, and worldwide, it's over a half a trillion. And so it, it's likely been sort of, you know, one of the most important job segments uh, out there from a growth point of view over the last decade. 
how have the number of developers distributing on the App Store changed since the introduction? I think significantly. You know, uh, we thought 500 was a was a really good number of apps in, in the beginning, and uh, and now you look at it with 1.8 million. I, I believe the number of developers behind that is over a million, if I remember correctly. How has the share of revenue the developers retain changed since the app store was introduced? Uh, it's only gone down. Uh, it started uh, with uh, zero percent for the free, uh, but thirty percent for everything else. And uh, but the, the change in subscription, the, the uh, video partners program, with the small business program, uh, with the things like the reader rule and the multi-platform rule, all of these things drive down the price. What about consumers? How has the App Store impacted them? I think it's given them an enormous level of innovation. Uh, you know, we, we have the, the uh, developers do some incredible work. And uh, together with, with partnering with, with Apple, we're able to deliver the, the customer even more innovation and, and, uh, and uh, more apps that, that enrich the lives. How have the prices consumers pay for software changed since inception of the App Store? Oh, they've, they've definitely gone down uh, significantly. If you think about the old world where uh, you buy a stretch wrap software uh, package in the local uh, retailer, uh, the, the commissions on that was 60 or 70 percent or so for the retailer. And now, of course, that is very different. But also because of the uh, number of developers and the competition for developers has also driven uh, the the price of the software down. How, in your view, has the Apple App Store uh, performed as compared to its competitors, similar app stores? I feel great about how it's performed. Uh, I, I feel great about it. I think it's a great opportunity for developers. It's, a, it's great for the user, uh, you know, most importantly. And, uh, and as I've said, the, the breadth of apps and the number of things you can do with them, it's hard to envision any part of your life that you can't have an app to help you out at this point. How would you compare the output rate for apps on the App Store to the output rate for apps on other stores operated by others? You know, I feel great about ours because it, it uh, is a key component in delivering the, the significantly lower malware on our on our platform than, than others have. Let's talk a little about IAP in app purchasing. And Epic has raised claims against Apple based on its in app purchasing functionality. You're aware of that, is that right, sir? Yes. What is IAP? It's the in app purchase uh, that's a feature of the App Store. Is it a payment processor? No, we have a payment processor, but it's called Apple Pay. Is there a fee for using IAP? No, there's no fee. And to be clear to the court, is the 15% or 30% commission that we just discussed, is that a payment processing fee? No, no. What is IAP's role with respect to the commission? Uh, IAP helps Apple uh, efficiently collect the commission. The commission is for a number of different things, from developer tools to the APIs and to the customer service that's provided. Uh, and one of those things is obviously the, the payment process itself. But all of these things, uh, it enables a Apple to efficiently do it. If, if not for IAP, we would have to come up with another system to uh, invoice developers, which I, I, I think would be a mess. Does the commission bear any relationship to Apple's investment in research and development? Yes, it provides a uh, return on our, our investment. Would developers still have to pay a commission if there was no IAP? Yes, of course. Yeah. 
One question that has come up a few times is about developers' ability to contact customers outside the App Store. Can developers who have apps in the App Store contact their customers to encourage them to use other payment methods? Yes, they can do mass marketing, uh, provided that the customer uh, will let them uh, have their email. You know, a Apple can't provide the email from a privacy point of view, but if the developer uh, gets the customer to, to do that, they can, you can send them along with all the other customers they've got uh, marketing material. Are developers allowed to include links in their app on the App Store directing customers to other payment options? No. And why is that, Mr. Kirk? Well, it would be akin to uh, Apple down at Best Buy saying, uh, Best Buy put in a sign there where uh, we are advertising that you can go across the street to the Apple Store and, and get an iPhone. It's, it's the same kind of thing. If, if the effort goes in uh, to uh, transacting with the customer, it seems like it ought to happen in, within the app. Thank you. And I'd like to shift topics a little bit and talk about the nature of competition that Apple faces. Sure. Let's first talk about the mobile devices. Does Apple face competition in the mobile device arena? It's fiercely competitive. And who are some of your competitors? Uh, Samsung, uh, Vivo, Oppo, uh, Huawei, uh, uh, Google. Uh, there's a whole list of different handset competitors. It, it's closely competitive. Does, does Apple have a dominant share in mobile devices? No, not at all. Worldwide, we have about a 15% share, and in the United States, it's more than that. It's more in the high 30s or so, but, but clearly not a dominant share. What is the dominant operating system for mobile devices? It's Android. Let's talk about the App Store in particular. What competition does the App Store face generally? Well, it faces competition from other App Stores. Uh, whether you're talking about Google or Samsung or you know, pretty much all the device sites have, a, have an App Store. Uh, it also, faces, from a developer point of view, it faces uh, competition from all of those as well. And plus, if you talk about games in particular, you have to get into Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. And so there's a long list of competition, both at the developer side and at the user side. Focusing on game apps in particular, I think you mentioned some of the competitors in your prior answer. Does, do you regularly monitor activity on other platforms with respect to game app transactions? We look at that. And you mentioned, I think, a couple. Let me ask you about a few more. Are you familiar with any streaming game services, Mr. Cook? Uh, somewhat. I'm not a gamer, but I have a uh, you know, cursory uh, view of it. And do you consider those streaming game services competitive to the game apps in the app store? Yes. What about developers' own um, app stores, like the Epic Games Store? Would you consider that to be a competitor to the game apps in the app store? Sure. And I think you mentioned consoles, Sony PlayStation, Microsoft Xbox. Are those also competitors? Yes. Epic has repeatedly asserted before this court that iPhone users are somehow locked in and are not able to switch um, iPhones to competitive mobile devices. To your knowledge, Mr. Cook, does Apple track whether users switch to other smartphone competitors? We look at third party data that does so. Let me ask you to look at DX3084 in your binder. John, I believe this document is already admitted into evidence. 3084? Yes. 
It is. Thank you, sir. And could you identify the document for the record? It's a uh, Ken Carl, who's a, a third party that does uh, this type of work, survey type of work, uh, survey for the U.S. market in the third calendar quarter of 2020. And Your Honor, we have um, increased the size of one page in this report because it was very difficult to read. Okay. It's labeled 3084A in the binding. Great, thank you. Uh, and in light of that, I'll admit 3084A is wrong. Thank you, Your Honor. This is uh, page .022 in that document. I see it. Could you explain to the court what this document conveys? Yeah, what it says is that um, in this, this is uh, from the third calendar quarter of 2019 to the third calendar quarter of 2020 by quarter. And it says that uh, of the people that purchased uh, smartphones that had an iPhone uh, that quarter that, that were coming from an iPhone that between 12% um, to 26% of the people switched to Android, depending okay. upon the quarter. Does Apple make it difficult for consumers to switch devices? No. Is Apple making any efforts in that arena at all, the switching arena? We're making efforts to get Android people to switch to the hot. <laughs> Of course. That's a very important uh, task for us. Have you heard of the data transfer project? Yes. Could you explain what that is for the course? It's a group of uh, uh, companies, uh, sort of the Google, ourselves, I believe Facebook is in there, um, that are working together to make sure that data is can be easily transferred from service to service. I think the first the first one that was being worked on, at least from our point of view, is photos. And so now it's quite simple to move your photos from Apple to Google. How has the ability to switch between iOS devices and Android devices changed over time in your view? It's gotten much easier because uh, if you look at what people are doing now, streaming is a key piece of it, like streaming uh, movies and streaming music. Uh, and so it's easy to just authenticate on another, um, on, on another device. And a lot of the uh, purchases of apps are in-app purchases, and a lot of those have their own authentication as well. And if the data transfer project, an effort to make that switching even easier. It, it is. And just so we're clear, other than Apple, are Android developers participating in that project? Yes. Thank you. And during the case, we've also seen references to documents, uh, in documents, to the terminology sticky, and assertions that sticky means locking customers in. Do I have documents with respect to this data? Transfer project? Um, Your Honor, there are not exhibits in the record. There's uh, there are public records on it, and we'd be happy to submit them. There's a public um, website announcing the project and the efforts that are being undertaken. Uh, well, it's got to be in the record if I'm going to consider it. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, we were talking about the term sticky. And have you heard that terminology used at Apple? Occasionally, but rarely. What do you understand it to mean when it's used? It means uh, to have such high customer satisfaction that people don't want to leave. Let me ask you to take a look at the document PX0892. It's also in your bond. <clears throat> It is towards the back. Oh, thank you. The third one coming in. <clears throat> okay. 
Yeah, I believe this document is also already in evidence. Yes, I'm double checking. Could you, could you identify the document for us? It's a uh, email uh, from Steve Jobs to the executive team at that time in 2010. Were you it, sorry, it sir. Looks to be an agenda for a meeting. And were you a member of the executive team at that point in time? Yes. Okay, if you could look on at the bottom of that first number one item, there is language. Tie all our products together so we further lock customers into our ecosystem. Do you see that? I do. What did you understand that to mean, sir? It means making all the products work so well together, people don't want to lose. Is there, sir, in your view, anything Apple can do to lock customers into iOS devices? Not that I'm aware of. Let's look on the second page of that document. <clears throat> There's also reference to the terminology stickies. I believe it's under item six. What did you understand that entry to mean? Could you point me to the... Um... It's um, item number six on the second page. It says mobile me, Q, S, J, Roger, Roger, on the top. It's also on your screen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's the same thing. It is to make the ecosystem have such high-grade customer satisfaction that people don't want to leave. Thank you, sir. And going back to switching for a moment, does Apple offer tools that help customers switch from Android devices to iOS devices? Yes, we do. Do you have an understanding as to whether Android device makers, say Samsung, have tools that assist customers in switching from Apple devices to Android devices? They do. Let's look at another document, PX0416. Now that you're one. vaccinated, yeah, we should definitely. Just, just don't tell Dan. Right in front of this one. Got together for what? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's go to the second page of this document. Actually, maybe the third page of this document. There's some text in red. And again, Mr. Cook, you can see it on your screen, if that's a little bit easier for you. There's language. And the number one most difficult to leave the Apple Universe app is iMessage. Do you see that? I see it. Do you agree with that, sir? No. Do you have an understanding as to what this individual was conveying here? Objection, Your Honor, Foundation. I understand. Okay, I'll back up. Mr. Cook, if you could look at the first page of the document. The top entry says, from Tim Cook. Do you see that? I do. Is this a document that you receive in the ordinary course of business? It is. And if you review the language that I just referenced, then you receive it? Yes. Okay. And can you give us then your understanding of what this individual was conveying? Objection, Your Honor, still foundation. He can testify as to his understanding. He cannot testify as to what the actual meaning is of Mr. Rogers in the email. No, yes, no. Your Honor. I, your understanding, Mr. Cook. My understanding is what, what he's saying is that uh, when he switched, from iPhone to an Android unit, he left his iMessage working, and and uh, messages were going there, but he wasn't getting them. Uh, I think that means that the setup is done correctly, because you can easily turn off your iMessage. Do you believe, sir, that the availability of iMessage on iOS devices has prevented customers from switching. No. 
is iMessage one of the highly ranked features of the iPhone? It's, it's a, uh, I would say it's a, a really good feature. Can iMessage messages be transferred to an Android device when a user switches? Yes. Now let's go back to Apple's 2020 10 And I'd like to talk about some of the P&L and profitability issues that have been raised with the court. The um, 2020 10K is DX4581. And if we go to page dot o two two in that document, you see information there for total net sales and net income for 2020, Mr. Chris? Yes. Can you use that information to determine what Apple's profit margin was for fiscal year 2020? Yes, if you divide the uh, 57.4 billion by the 274.5, uh, I believe, or if my memory serves me correct, you get to 20.9 percent. And so, do you consider any other profit margin in running the business? It's not the way we do it. And does Apple prepare fully burdened P&L statements for its various business units? No. The ordinary course No. Can you explain why not? Well, because first of all, allocation of cost, of uh, joint cost, are very difficult to do and, and is open for debate about how to do it. And so you would wind up getting the company focused on arguing the, between the different areas about where cost should be. And it would be totally unproductive in, in, in my mind. Steve actually did this when he came back to the company. If I remember correctly, he told me a story once that he found Apple losing a billion dollars a year, but all of the divisions all making money. And so you can imagine uh, what he then did. He just he blew it up, and I've never wanted to to go back to that point. I mean, just always kept it as one. Has the practice of looking at the company's profitability overall enhanced? the company's ability to compete in your view? I think so, because it, it means that we spend more time focusing on customers and, and not focusing on each other. Has Apple ever attempted to determine the specific profitability of the App Store as a standalone business unit? No. Do you believe the App Store is profitable? Yes, I do. Are you able to give us a specific number on possibility? No, we haven't done that, but, you know, I, I have a feel, if you will. The court has heard some testimony from one of the ethics experts, from Mr. Bond, about his interpretation of certain documents. And I'd like to turn to that now, starting with PX2385 in your binding. <coughs> Your Honor, the court has admitted this into evidence and has granted our motion to seal. I would just like to ask some general questions about the document now on the public record, and we can go into a field session later if there's a need for detailed examination. That's fine. So let's look at 2385. And if we could look at dot six in particular, so we have it up on the screen, click six. So um, you want it on the screen? Yes, please. I'm sorry, but that's just a cover page. I'm sorry, <laughs> don't get along. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I'm worried there's that no that. language on it um, that, is, that is problematic, but let's not, let's not put it on the screen. Um, tell us, sir. Uh, this um, description of the document. What was the purpose of this presentation? 
I believe it was a uh, one-off presentation uh, that looked at profitability trends uh, over, over time. Were you attempting to compare the re relative profitability of your products and services in this document? <clears throat> well, we, we didn't try to allocate costs, as you can probably tell from the document itself. It's, it's, uh, later in the document, it makes it clear that that was not done. And so it, it has a limited use to it. And you mentioned that it was used to look at trends. Can you explain that for the course? Well, if you if you don't allocate uh, like we like we don't, and you compare the numbers year to year to year to year, you can draw certain inferences to those as long as that allocation methodology is the same. Were documents like this PX two three eight five routinely prepared at Apple? This is the only one that I recall. And what is the date of this document? It's September of 2019. Does this document include an assessment of the App Store's profitability? So, no, again, we don't do uh, profitability at that level. An ethics expert, Mr. Bonds, testified that it showed operating margins, fully burdened operating margins for the App Store. Is that correct, sir? No. Let's look specifically at page dot eight. Yes. Without going into any of the specifics, sir, I would just like you to explain what is on this page. Starting first with just the, num the revenue caption. What is captured there? Again, without going into the details of the document. Right, it, it shows a uh, revenue by product and some of the services, and then sort of the catch all categories, I guess. And the gross margin? Uh, same thing, but, but, but at the gross margin level. What about OPEX? It shows a OPEX for the company that's in the sort of the total, and then it shows only uh, sort of an unallocated OPEX methodology under it. Does the number for the app store in the OPEX column include all of the expenses associated with the app store? No, not at all. You have an understanding of, in a general sense, which categories of expenses are included in the object that we've collected here. This would only be some of the very direct kind of costs, like after review would be in here as an example. Operating margin on this document is just a simple arithmetic of gross margin minus OPEX. Does this document convey a operating margin? for the App Store on a fully burdened basis after taking account of all of its costs? It does not. Let's look at page dot two four in the document. Does this page, sir, <clears throat> in your opinion, relate to the allocation issue we were just discussing? It, it does. You can see here clearly that the uh, R&D and FCMA uh, allocation to services is very, very small. And, and so it, 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 it's just a reminder that, that the that's not the purpose of the analysis. And is there a entry in this document for the overall OPEX for the app store? There's not. And on this OPEX product allocation page, 
is there an entry for OPEX to the app store? There's not. Mm -hmm. How long have you with this document, sir? It's a limited audience. Uh, my recollection is it would have been, uh, and if I look at the, what, what reminds me is looking at the distribution list of this document, it was the CFO and I and some of the CFO staff. Would you share this document with any of the business unit leaders? No, again, it, it has a limited purpose to it. So uh, I don't believe any business leaders saw it. Did you use the information in this document to make any business decisions? No. Let's look at two more pages of the document. Let's look at page dot one three. Do you see a, a reference to the app store there? I do. Are the operating margin numbers reported there fully burdened operating margin for the app store as if it were a standalone business unit? They are not. <clears throat> do the margins that are reported here for the app store refer to the iPhone app store as well as the Mac app store? They do. Now let's look at another document that Cord Maker can testimony about. This is PX2392. This is similar, Your Honor. It's been sealed, and I just want to ask some general questions about it. This is, I believe it has been admitted also, yeah. It has. So can you explain what this document is? It is a appears to be like a benchmarking exercise uh, from looking at reported operating margins from companies that, that did report for the full company and then and then uh, overlaying that to this unallocated view of op margin for Apple. Does this document contain in information about the app store's profitability? It does not. And what are the margins referenced for the app store in this document? They are uh, arrived at, I believe, by just taking the sum of the direct opt and subtracting that from those margins. So it's a very, it's not fully loaded as, as you point out. Is the um, operating margin reported here higher than it would be if there had been a fully burdened exercise? Yes, definitely. Let's look at page 2392.3. And again, just some general questions about it. You mentioned that there's a comparison of margins for other companies. And I see companies like Netflix there. Are the margins for a company like Netflix directly comparable to the margin for a business like the App Store? No. And can you explain why not? Well, because Netflix number would be their the real total company reported 10, 10K or 10Q kind of number, depending upon the, the year, where our number on here, I, say, I don't see Apple on here, Apple Inc. Apple, Apple Inc. is not cited here, but if, if, if it were on here, you could then compare Apple Inc. to Netflix, right, a total company. But when, when you take the uh, operating margin as stated here, which only includes partial of the allocation, it, it has limited meaning. Um, are you familiar with the type of accounting that one would use if they were trying to 
account for the app stores as a separate business unit? I'm aware of different ways to do it if, if we wanted to do that. Are you familiar with the term agency accounting or net basis accounting? Yes. Could you explain what that is, sir? Yeah. In, a, um, in an agency model, the, in this case, would be, as an example of, of the app store, the developer sets the price. When the developer sets the price, we, Apple, only book the net revenue. And so in a case where there's 15% uh, commission, we would only book the 15%. In a regular accounting model, obviously you would book the, if it's a dollar, you would book a dollar. And then you would show the cost of the, of the developer, which is 85% in this case, or 85 cents uh, going to the developer. And so it, it, it's a consequence of accounting that isn't that obvious or intuitive. And in general, if one were comparing a company that reports on that agency on that basis and one that reports in what you said as a uh, buy sell on a regular basis, how would the margin compare for the same underlying economic tax? Well, you couldn't compare them, really. They would not be comparable. You would have to go back and uh, account for things in the same manner in order to make the numbers comparable. But when you book on a net basis, it has the uh, effect of increasing your margin, obviously, because you're taking the bulk of the cost out and not showing it. Understood, sir. And then I'd just like to turn to an issue that the court actually raised with us this morning, and it's the nature of the relief that EPIC seeks. Um, EPIC, in this case, seeks an order requiring Apple to permit sideloading of unreviewed apps on the iPhone and to permit alternative app stores that would offer apps that have not been reviewed by Apple. What, sir, would be the consequences of such an order in your view? I think it would be terrible for the user uh, because if you look at it today, uh, we review 100,000 or so apps a week and reject about 40,000 for different reasons. You can imagine if you turn review off how long it would take the app store to just become a toxic kind of mess. Uh, and that would be terrible for the user. It would also be terrible for the developer because the developer depends on the store being a safe and trusted place where customers want to come and feel good about transacting. What about Apple's IP rights? What impact would such a ruling have on Apple's IP rights? Uh, it, uh, it's probably more of a legal question, but it seems like it would be forcing us to license our IP, and, and, and uh, I can't imagine that. Does Apple license its iOS? No. Um, what would be the impact on Apple's ability to meet its commitment to its customers, the safety, security, and privacy commitments we talked about at the outset? We could no longer make the promise. Uh, because the, the, if you think about how we make the promise of safety, security, and privacy, uh, a large part of that is depends on this app review. And we, we believe customers want that. I, I know they do because they tell me that. Epic also asked the court to enter an order that provides Apple can no longer require developers to use IAP for purchases of digital goods. What would be the consequences of that ruling? Well, it would wind up um, where customers would then have to place their credit card in all of these different, for all of these different apps. And so it would be a huge convenience issue, but also the fraud risk would go up dramatically if you're taking your credentials and putting them in numerous times. Also, uh, we'd have to come up with an alternate way of collecting that commission. And uh, I strongly believe that IAP is the most efficient way to collect it because you would then have to figure out how to 
track what's going on and invoice it and then show it to the developer. It, it seems like a, a process that doesn't need to exist in there. Thank you, sir. And then I'd just like to go back to the data transfer project that the court inquired about. Uh, Donna, may I approach the witness to provide an exhibit? Yes, you may. Mr. Kerr, can you take a look at that and tell us whether this is the public report about the data transfer project you mentioned earlier in the testimony? It is. And, Your Honor, this is marked as DX 5573. You would like to admit it into evidence. Any objection? Just one moment, if I could, Your Honor. I've seen this for the first time just now. No objection. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, we have a small amount of field testimony. Um, we would propose that we pass the witness for public class now. And then the parties can move into a field proceeding if necessary. All right. Uh, Mr. Bornstein, cross. Your Honor, may Ms. Cross approach with a binder. All right, Mr. Bornstein, you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and, and I, too, have some material that uh, I'm going to try to do on public record with Mr. Cook, uh, if everyone is careful about saying numbers out loud. Uh, I'm but, sure he's sensitive to that. Right. Mr. Cook, nice to see you again. Good to see you again. Yeah. person this time. Uh, I understand from the, from the press it's your first time testifying in the court. It is. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you should have, I, I think, a, a number of binders now in front of you. Uh, I have two. Okay. Well, do you also still have the binder that Ms. Moyer gave you? I, I do. I just put it back there. Okay. Can, can I ask you to take a look at that one to start, please? And in that binder, there's a document labeled PX0089 that Ms. Moy asked you about. Yes. Um, and this is a document that related to discovery on the App Store, correct? Yes. And uh, in the email at the top of the page uh, from Mr. Uh, Fisher, uh, you noted that there were uh, some discussion about improvements to discovery that um, Apple was considering or planning at this time, correct? Yes. And Mr. Fisher notes uh, that there are some exciting announcements that he would like to be able to make at WWDC in 2016. Do you see that? Yes. And those were announcements about the enhancement of discovery, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. And the big announcement at WWDC 2016 about the enhancement of discovery was search ads, wasn't it? I recall. 
Uh, I mean, search ads were now. Search ads were. Oh, run that time. Yeah. So search ads are a, a feature that Apple introduced so that developers can pay in order to achieve discovery on the App Store. Correct? Yes. And so the big announcement that everyone was looking towards here to make things better for developers was another way for Apple to make money off of discovery. Correct? No, uh, I believe there were. So when, the answer is no, thank you. So when you said in your email, we need to do something to make discovery better, what happened is the very next WWDC, Apple announced search ads so that developers then have to pay in order to get their own apps discovered in a search on the App Store. Isn't that what happened? The sequence of events? I believe we also announced the Today tab, which uh, also did editorial and really, got, really launched a lot of apps through the editorial. To, together with search ads that require people to pay to have their own app appear near the top of the search list. Correct? We have one paid slot for ads. And that was announced in 2016, correct? I don't know that 2016 on that one. So we, we had uh, earlier in the week, so a number of, uh, excuse me, last week, uh, time flies, a number of economists come in and, and, and talk about your business. Uh, so I would like now to have, to have the opportunity to ask you a question or two about your business instead. Um, and one of the things the economists have been debating, as the court mentioned this morning, is market definition. So let me ask you directly, sir. Does Apple compete against Google in operating systems? We compete uh, against their devices that they enable. And so we compete against uh, Samsung and LG and... So your testimony is that you do not compete against Google in operating systems, or you do, sir? We obviously benchmark them, but customers don't buy uh, operating systems, they buy devices. Right. Do you recall giving an interview at the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting in 2019, sir? I don't. Right. Let's see if we can refresh your recollection. Mr. Rudd, can you please play uh, the clip we've marked as PX1721 for Mr. Cook? We compete on the operating system side with, with Google and Microsoft. We compete in the hardware space with Samsung and, and Huawei and many Some other uh, uh, prominent uh, Chinese companies uh, in particular. So, Mr. Cook, my question for you is, was that you on the video saying we compete against Google on the operating system side? It sure looked like me. Great. Sounded like you too, sir. Um, we um, gave some testimony uh, this morning about uh, profitability, quite a bit of it, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you testified that Apple does not maintain a separate PL for the App Store, correct? Correct. And you testified that Apple doesn't go through the cost allocation process to know what the profitability of the App Store is, correct? Correct. Can we at least agree that you know the revenues for the App Store? Yes. Okay. You track that information? Yes. And you personally receive reports on, on revenue, correct, of the App Store? Yes. Right. Now, you were invited, sir, to a uh, Senate hearing last month that was chaired by Senator Klobuchar, correct? No. Uh, Apple was invited to go to the, to the hearing, correct? Yes. And uh, the subject of that hearing was examining competition in app stores. Is that accurate? I believe so. Uh, and uh, you didn't go, Mr. Andier, uh, an in-house Apple lawyer, attended on behalf of the company. Is that correct? That's correct. And when I say attended, I believe he testified remotely. Is that accurate? He did. All right. Uh, and do you remember that Mr. Andier was asked about app store revenues at that hearing? I don't remember that. All right, let's see if we can refresh your recollection on, on that one as well. Mr. Rudd, can you please play uh, the clip of Mr. Andrew's testimony? Do I have an I know. I'm sorry. What's that, Your Honor? Do, is this identified? Uh, yes, yeah, this is uh, going to be PX1677, Your Honor. And uh, to that end, I'd like to move into evidence the prior um, 
uh, the prior clip that we played uh, of Mr. Cook, which was marked, and we'll provide to the court, of course, uh, that one is marked as PX1721. 1721 is admitted. 1677 will be. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ron. Do you know how much revenue it generated last year? I mean, it's relevant because we we're talking about a monopoly situation. Senator, understood. Uh, you know, when we look at the App Store, it's not a separate standalone business for us. It's an innovative feature of our devices. And so we don't have a separate profit and loss statement uh, for the App Store. Uh, so, Your Honor, I would move 1677 into evidence, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mr. Andy, Mr. Cook, uh, Mr. Andy gave the same statement that you did, that there's no separate profit and loss statement for the App Store, correct? That is likely. Yeah, but he did not give the revenue information that the senator asked for, did he? Not in that call. Right. And do you understand he did it in some other part of the hearing? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, now, we've seen the documents that you testified with um, Ms. Maya about uh, this uh, one-off presentation that you received, uh, correct? About profitability uh, of the App Store and other segments of the business. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd like to ask you to take, take a look at that, and I'm going to give you a choice, sir. It's in my binder, and it's in the one that Ms. Maya gave you. Whichever one you'd like to look at, it's labeled PX2385. You have it? I do. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Now, first of all, this um, uh, document begins with an email uh, that is directed to you and Mr. Maestri. Do you see that? I do. And Mr. Maestri is your chief financial officer? Yes. Okay. And the individual who sent this email, uh, I hear I might botch her first name, so I'll just say it's Ms. Casey. Sayori Casey. Thank you. Uh, and she is um, uh, someone who works with Mr. Maestri in the finance department, is that right? She is. And she uh, heads the corporate FP&A group, is that right? That's correct. That's corporate financial planning and analysis? That's right. Okay. Um, and it was Ms. Casey who uh, sent this information to you, is that right? Yes. And you had a, a meeting with Ms. Casey uh, and others from the finance organization about this document that we're looking at. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to just go back and look at some of the portions of the documents that you uh, discussed with me, uh, Maya. Uh, first of all, uh, you were looking with her at page dot 12. Can you go there, please? You have that well. Great. Um, and on this page, and I'll do my best not to say uh, to say numbers out loud. Uh, but on this page, uh, uh, Ms. Casey and her team at Corporate Financial Planning and Analysis came up with what she titled "Fiscal Year 20 Services Summary." Yes. Yes. And it uh, breaks out into uh, different uh, quarters of this document: revenue, gross margin operating expenses and operating margin for different services at Apple, correct? Correct. Including the app store. Yes, app store is listed. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a document that was uh, prepared for purposes of a meeting with you, Mr. Maestri, correct? Yes, I would think so. Um, and uh, your uh, testimony about um, uh, these materials is that they were not uh, representing a fully burdened p &L. Is that accurate? That, that's correct. Okay. Now, you have not uh, reviewed the expert report from Mr. Barnes that Ms. Moyer referred to, have you? I have not. So you don't know what methodology he used to come to the conclusion 
that these were in fact fully burdened numbers. Do you? I do not. Okay. Uh, are you aware that he took account of the agency model accounting issue that you described with Ms. Meyer this morning? I do not. And are you aware uh, that he was able to tie out these numbers to publicly reported Apple financials? I'm not. Okay. Um, can I ask you to look at the next page of the document, uh, dot 13, please? You have that? I do. Yeah. Now, Dot 13 uh, is titled Profitability Summary, correct? Yes. And it has on the right side of the document at the top uh, a chart titled Services uh, Operating Margin Percentage. Do you see that? Yes. And it has a number there that I won't read out loud for the App Store, correct? It does. And it tracks that over a period of five years. Yes. Um, and uh, again, your view is these are not fully burdened um, numbers, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and I believe it was your testimony that Apple doesn't allocate costs uh, to be able to assess profitability, correct? We don't allocate, we fully don't allocate costs, correct. Okay. Now, if you look at the bottom of the document, it says uh, in the center there, based on method two for allocation OPEX. Do you see that? I do. Now, method two is not actually described here on this page, is it? It is not. Okay. And if you take a look at each of the next several pages of the document, you will see it again says that the allocation that's being done here is based on method two. Do you see that? I do. Um, so your corporate financial planning and analysis group does have, I guess, at least two methods, maybe more, for allocating uh, operating expenses, correct? I assume so. Okay. Um, and you're so, uh, it, it is a methodology that is used sufficiently frequently, apparently, that when Ms. Casey presented it to you, she just listed method two without further elaboration, correct? I think the, the chart that shows the allocation methodology is the, is the wave chart that we were looking at earlier. Yeah, right, you're talking about dot 24, sir? Uh, let me take a look, make sure we're in sync. <clears throat> yeah, and you can see there on dot 24 down at the bottom, uh, your corporate financial planning and analysis group, again, just said based on method two, correct? Okay. Yes, so I think it shows method two here. But you don't know that because you're not aware of what method two is and you're, you're interpreting the document now on the stand, is that right? I'm interpreting the document. Okay. Um, let's uh, take a look at dot 18, please. And you look at this one, there's Ms. Moya as well. Can you call that? You look at this one with Ms. Moya as well. Do you recall that, sir? I'm not sure we look at this one. That 18? 18. 18. Dot 18. 18. Dot 1A. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, great. Uh, and this one has over on the left side in the middle, again, uh, operating margin numbers for the App Store broken out separately, correct? It does. Right. And you were asked a question about whether this included both the iOS App Store and the Mac App Store. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, and I don't know if you're going to tell me that this is confidential and you need to do it in sealed session, but what portion of uh, the revenues and uh, associated with the App Store come from the Mac App Store versus the iOS App Store. I get you, Your Honor, that calls for information that has been sealed and needs to be done in the field session. Okay, Your Honor. Um, I will ask, may, may, maybe given Your Honor's rulings about uh, uh, sealing, I can ask the following question. Do you have a, uh, an understanding, sir, of the order of magnitude of uh, the uh, iOS App Store versus the Mac App Store revenues? The iOS would be larger. Yeah. How much larger? A, a lot larger. Okay. We'll try and do the rest under seal. I don't want to trip over anything. Um, 
take a look. Let's go back to that um, uh, chart, the wave chart, as you called it, on dot 24 of this one-off presentation. Now, you were talking um, with Ms. Moyer about the R&D numbers in your, uh, in your 10K earlier, you recall that? Yes. Yeah. Now, those R&D numbers were for the company as a whole. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, the uh, allocation document here that we're looking at at dot 24 uh, shows how at least your corporate financial planning and analysis group allocated those R&D numbers to different products within the company, correct? For purposes of this analysis. Yes, and so for purposes of this analysis, they sat down and they actually allocated the R&D to different products within the company, correct? They, they did something. That's what they did. They, it's on the page, right, sir? On a direct basis, on some of the direct costs. Right. Be clear. Okay, so they allocated direct costs based on the top portion of the document here. And then they allocated shared costs and they allocated allocated costs. Do you see that? I see the document, yes. All right. And, and I, I am correct in describing it that they allocated not just direct R&D, but shared and allocated R&D as well. Correct? Shared for purposes of this analysis. And, and they went through and they did this work for you. Correct? It's here. They did the work for me. Okay. Yes. And in doing that work, so they have allocated a total amount of R&D for the rest of services um, uh, product that appears in the bottom of the page that, as you said, is a very, very, very small little purple sliver. Is that right? Yes. And rest of services is where the app store lives, correct? Because it's charged. Yeah. Um, At this uh, meeting uh, that you had with uh, Mr. Maestri and Ms. Casey, uh, you had some discussion uh, about this document, sir, correct? We had a meeting about it, yes. yes. And uh, you or Mr. Maestri had some follow-up questions about this, did you not? Uh, I don't recall that. Well, take a look at the first page of the document, okay. email from these places. And she says, Tim, hi, Tim, look up. Please find below the three follow-up items from the profitability meeting. Do you see that? I do. And she refers, and I'm not going to read numbers here, but she refers in the first item, which refers to iPhone profit, she says, as discussed, and then she proceeds to get some information. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. Okay. Uh, and then she provides two other uh, topics, followed by any other questions, please let us know. Do you see that? Yes. Now, does this refresh your recollection that you and Mr. Maestri had some follow-up questions and considered this sufficiently important to ask some follow-up questions about? I don't remember the particulars, but I see that here. Okay. Um, and then at this uh, meeting, there was uh, another document that you went over. It wasn't just this one-off presentation. You looked at something else as well. Isn't that right? Uh, can you put me to a document? Or do, you, do you recall that? No, no I don't. Okay, great. So, so, so take, take, take a look, if you would, at 2392. You look at this with Ms. Moye as well. The benchmarking document, you called it. Yes. And you see it has a date on it, September 25, 2019. It's on the very first page. Yes, I see it. Next to the same date as the meeting we were just talking. Yes. Okay. And uh, this document again has um, information about the profitability of the app store on a standalone basis for the purpose of this work, correct? No, not on a standalone basis. Well, it has, it, it, uh, it has information that Ms. Casey and her team calculated about the profitability of the App Store. It appears on page dot three, correct? It, with the assumptions of that chart. All right. Which is not a fully loaded cost. 
And again, you haven't looked at the analysis that Mr. Barnes did to assess whether it was fully loaded or not, correct? I don't know what Mr. Barnes did, but I do know that this is not fully loaded. I understand your testimony on that, sir. Okay. Um, and this wasn't a one-off presentation, though, was it, sir? Uh, I don't remember having this type of presentation before. How about since? Uh, I don't know. All right, well, but it's not in the it's not in the quarterly um, cadence of uh, forecast and actual. All right, well, let's take a look at what happened in the quarterly cadence. Take a look, please, sir, at PX twenty three ninety one. This time, I think you will need to be in my binder because your council did not include it in the one that they provided. Which binder number? Apparently, it's number one, sir. Okay. Which binder is it in, sir? Number one. I just have one very large binder. I wish I had smaller ones myself. Well, if anybody knows where I can give away <laughs> lots of thick binders, let me know. Accumulate them. Tell me when you've gotten this. Thing, sir. I'm, I'm there. Okay, so you have 2391 uh, uh, in front of you, correct? 2391, yeah. Yes, and Your Honor, this is in evidence um, subject to a request from Apple to seal, so I'm again going to try to be careful. Right. Um, now, uh, I assume, sir, that you don't, as uh, CEO of a $2 trillion ish company, spend a lot of time reviewing documents that you find not to be terribly informative. I spend some time doing that, but hopefully not a lot. Okay. And your team tries to give you things that they believe you will find informative, correct? Or, okay. Uh, and you had asked Ms. Casey some follow-up questions about the prior profitability analysis we were just looking at, correct? I'm not sure I did or we did. Fair enough. It's not clear. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. But a, a member of the senior Apple management team asked her some questions that she provided answers to. Fair. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and the following quarter, uh, this document here, 2391, is dated... Uh, December 18, 2019, correct? Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. on the first page. Uh, hold on. December 18th of, of 2019. Okay. And this is again from uh, the Corporate Financial Planning and Analysis Group, correct? Correct. And if you go, so to uh, page uh, dot 104, you will see something labeled profitability, correct? Okay, and then on page dot 105, you will see something that looks an awful lot like what was on 2385.13, correct? Another chart with uh, operating margin profitability summary. Do you see that? I see it. Okay. And this document has been updated by a quarter. It's got another quarter's worth of information that your corporate financial planning and analysis team put into this material for you, correct? Uh, yes. And, and again, sir, they use, as you can see at the bottom, method two for allocation of OPEX, correct? Yes. And they have come up again, it. sorry, I see it, great. They have come up again with a, uh, an operating margin for the App Store that they are, again, presenting to you uh, and others at, uh, uh, in the Apple management team, correct? Again, they're doing a uh, analysis that's not fully loaded. Okay, but they have again, sir, come up the second time with a profitability analysis of the App Store. Isn't that right? That's not fully loaded. They have come up with a profitability analysis of the App Store that you're saying is not fully loaded. Correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, and this document, you know, sir, was found in your files. Is that right? Uh, I don't know that. Do you know that your counsel produced this document to us? 
after your deposition had been taken on the very last day of fact discovery in this case? I don't know that. Um, let me find a place to put my binder one second. Uh, so you can probably put that away okay. too, so we can uh, have some more space in front of you. Could you uh, agree with me that um, one of the benefits of the IAP system that we talked about some this morning is to reduce friction for customers? By friction, you mean that they don't have to put in their credentials in numerous different places? Well, that's a form of friction, isn't it? I think of it as, I just wanted to make sure we were in Great. Um, and uh, would you agree with me then that one of the benefits of IAP for your customers is that it makes it easier for them to make purchases. Good. Okay. Um, and it's a, a, a convenience for them. Is that right? I don't know what And Apple doesn't want to make its customers leave the app to go make a purchase if it's possible for them to make it within the app. Isn't that fair? They can, they can uh, leave the app if they uh, want to, obviously. Sure, my, my question is, Apple doesn't want the customers to leave the app. We want them purchase. to do what they want to do. Well, our focus is on them. It's a, it's a negative user experience, or if they have to leave the app, isn't it? From my point of view, yes. Okay. And if they do leave the app, also Apple doesn't make any money on the in-app purchases. Isn't that correct? If they buy it off of the store, we would not make any money. Okay, so it's fair to assume, sir, that Apple would prefer that people make their purchases in the app so that Apple can earn some revenue and it can be a good user experience rather than have people go outside of the app. Isn't that fair? Sure, we try to make it as easy as possible. Okay. Uh, and when it's easy as possible, it means people are more likely to make a purchase. Isn't that right? Probably. Right. And Apple will make the same 30% or maybe 15% depending on the circumstances, whether it is a spontaneous impulse purchase or whether it is a very thoughtfully considered decision. Isn't that right? In either case. Right. And Apple has, has no policy against impulse purchases. Isn't that right? We provide parental controls, and so that uh, parents can uh, make sure their kids aren't using them for impulse purchases. Right, but you have um, the uh, a system set up in order to uh, to achieve that, correct? We have parental controls set up to make sure that it doesn't happen with kids. Right. If if the parents choose to enable it, correct? If the parent chooses to enable it, right. um, and in fact. In-app purchases using IAP constitute a um, very substantial percentage of App Store revenue. Is that correct? It would be the, the dominant way of purchasing, I believe. In, in, and in terms of the revenue that Apple earns, it is the dominant source of App Store revenue. Fair? I think so. Okay, we, we can, I can show you some documents yeah. in the field session. I didn't want to yeah. get numbers off here now. Um, am I right that Apple does not believe, well, let me do this way. We do not believe, sir, that it is as easy to buy virtual currency or other items on the web as it is to buy them while you are in an app on an iOS device. Is that fair? It, it takes another click to leave the app and get into the, to the web, but, but people do it. A lot of people do it. But, but taking another click is a form of friction, correct? It's another step. Right. And avoiding that kind of friction is actually quite valuable in your industry. Am I right about that? Um, I'm not sure I follow your question. What do you mean by valuable? Well, I'll try and make it more concrete. I mean, I mean money. I mean, you earn money based on this. So, for example, 
Apple has an arrangement with Google under which the Google search engine is the default search engine on the iPhone. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And that's a very lucrative arrangement for Apple. Correct? Is this the Yamaskin? This is cross overruled. That's a very lucrative arrangement for Apple, correct? We do so in the best interest of the user. Sir, it's a very lucrative arrangement for Apple. Am I right about that? They pay us money. Is that what you mean? They pay you, and I'm going off public information here, so this is not something to be sealed, but the government claims uh, that they pay you upwards of $10 billion. Is that accurate? I don't remember the exact number. You don't know whether it's upwards of $10 billion? I don't know. Okay. Um, but now, this is just to establish the Google search engine as a default. That's what this is, correct? No, it's the searches themselves. But well, a, a, a user can change the default search engine on their iPhone, correct? That's correct. Right. So I can, I have an iPhone, sir. I hope it still works after the examination today. <laughs> uh, but I, I, can go, I can go onto my, my iPhone and I can go into settings and I can change my, my search engine, correct? You can, yeah. Right. Um, but that's, that is something that uh, is sufficiently frictionful, to coin a word, uh, that Google pays a lot of money to Apple to avoid, correct? Uh, that's not the way I look at it. Okay. So Google does pay a lot of money to Apple in order to be the default so that people don't have to make that extra click. Right? They pay a lot for the searches that come across. Uh, okay. They pay a lot to be, to, to be the default so that they get those searches. Right? You'd have to ask them what they pay a lot for, I guess. Right. So you, you, you don't have an idea as a recipient of these billions, billions of dollars of why they are paying you don't have an idea, sir, as the recipient of these billions of dollars, why it is that Google has entered into this deal? That's what you're saying? Probably a better question for them. Okay. I, I asked you, sir, when you do have a pretty good idea why they pay billions of dollars to Apple in order to do the default search engine, don't you? I don't think it's wrong. Oh, you can answer if you know. I think it depends on the search engine that I testified to, okay. which they get because they're the default engine, right? What they get is the customer leaves the default design. Right. Um, this we will have to come back to so that I can preserve your confidentiality. Um, you so reviewed the decision that, I'm switching topics here. You, you reviewed the decision that Apple made to terminate the developer program account associated with uh, Epic Games Inc. Is that correct? Yes. And you agreed with that decision? Yes, I did. And you believe that the uh, actions that Epic took in August of 2020 before Fortnite was removed from the App Store were malicious. Is that correct? Yes. And by malicious, what you mean is it was uh, planned and it was deceptive and it was hidden. Fair? Yes. And you're aware, are you, so that Mr. Schiller told this court in a declaration in September that as a result of those actions, it was critical for Apple to cut off Epic's access to the App Store so that Epic could not continue to jeopardize the iOS ecosystem. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of exactly what he said, but it sounds, it sounds correct. Okay. Are you aware that Mr. Schiller told the court in that same declaration that the only viable option is for Apple to cease doing business with Epic, including all contracts that the company has? Is that something that you knew? No. Um, and you also know that despite these very dire warnings, Apple offered Epic the ability to come back to the App Store with Fortnite. You know that? Yes, I do. Okay. 
And in fact, in uh, your counsel's opening statement here a few weeks ago, uh, uh, she repeated that invitation, turned to Mr. Sweeney, let him know that Epic was, was still welcome to come back. Did you know that? Yes. Uh, and did you authorize that? I, the whole time you said that. And you, you said that even though you told the court that Epic engaged in malicious activity and that the only viable option that Apple had was to terminate business with Epic entirely, right? Correct. And if, what you said about why you would be willing to have Epic back is for the benefit of the users. Correct. Is that right? Sure. But if Epic were the bad actor that Mr. Schiller claimed, it would not be to the benefit of users to have Epic back on the store, would it? I think it would be to the benefit of users to have them back on the store if they abide by the rules. But if they are a, a bad and malicious actor, sir, who couldn't be trusted to come back such that the only viable option is to terminate all contracts, how can it be to the benefit of users to have Epic back? Because the user is caught in between two companies here, and it's not the right thing to do with the user. So your, your testimony, sir, is that you're going to have this malicious actor back for the benefit of users, and that the hundreds of millions of dollars that Apple has made off of Fortnite over the years had nothing to do with it. And we're thinking about the money at all. And the, 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 prin about the, users. The, the principles that you've articulated about the integrity of the iOS ecosystem, they didn't survive the wilted, really, when Apple saw the chance to have Fortnite come back and continue to make money off of the, the purchases that people who play Fortnite and use Fortnite make. Isn't that right? Yeah. And your testimony is that you told the court you had to get rid of them, but you were still willing to take them back just because you were thinking of users and not thinking of the profit that you would make. We always put the user at the center of everything that we did. So that, that's your testimony, that you would have to come back to the users. Yeah regardless of the amount of money that Fortnite has made for you over the years. It has nothing to do with money. Okay. So you, you testified before uh, Congress last year, correct? I did. Okay. And do you recall at that testimony being asked about whether Apple retaliates against developers? I don't. Okay. I, I will try and refresh your recollection okay. again. Um, this is uh, PX 1725 that I will ask Mr. Rudd to play for you. This is going to be a video, so. Mm -hmm. Has Apple ever retaliated against or disadvantaged a developer who went public about their frustrations with uh, the App Store? Sir, we don't, we do, do not retaliate or bully people. It's strongly against our uh, company culture. So that was, that was your testimony before Congress? Yes. Okay, Your Honor, I would move 17, PX 1725 into evidence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you maintain still, sir, that Apple did not retaliate against Epic by threatening to shut down the Unreal Engine after um, uh, Fortnite was removed from the App Store. Is that correct? That's correct. And you testify as well, sir, that Apple did not retaliate against down dog, the yoga app, for coming and testifying here in this action? I'm sorry, I'm not even familiar with that one. Can, okay. can you point me to something? Or? I'll, I'll ask you a, a different question, sir, if you're not familiar with it. Are you familiar with your developer program license agreement? No. Okay. Do you know what that is? I, I have a very uh, knowledge of it. All right, let, let me see if I can uh, prompt a little, uh, a little something for you. Look at PX 2943, please. 2943, which is already in evidence. There it is. You have that, sir? I found it, yeah. Great. And this is labeled uh, Schedule 2. Do you see that? Yes, and this is Schedule 2 to the Developer Program License Agreement that Apple requires developers who would like to use the App Store to sign. Is that right? I don't know. Okay. 
Um, let me ask you then, maybe, maybe this will be a quicker portion of the examination if you don't know, but I'll direct you to one, to one piece of it and see if we can make a little bit of progress. Uh, uh, paragraph, uh, excuse me, paragraph 7.1, you'll find on page dot nine. You have that? I do. Okay. And, and I'll call your attention, sir, just to the bottom right corner of the document. You can see it's dated March 31, 2021. You see that? Yeah. So this is a recent uh, version of your schedule, too. Uh -huh. Are you aware that there was language added to this document in this most recent version relating to the circumstances under which Apple can terminate developers? Uh, no, I'm not. Right, well, let me ask you to just look very quickly then, sir, at the last sentence of uh, paragraph 7.1, which states, if at any time Apple determines or suspects that you or any developers with which you are affiliated have engaged in or encouraged or participated with other developers to engage in any suspicious, misleading, fraudulent, improper, unlawful, or dishonest act or omission, Apple may withhold payments due to you or such other developers. Did I at least read that correctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, and now you, you had no idea that this language was added to the document? No. Uh, you understand now in reading it that this entitles Apple, if, uh, uh, if it is lawful, to um, withhold uh, money from developers or any of their affiliates when Apple suspects conduct that it believes to be suspicious. You see that? Objection foundation. Oh, world. I see it. Okay. And the consequence of Apple's unilateral suspicion that people are engaging in suspicious behavior or encouraging suspicious behavior is that Apple can withhold payments both to that developer and to all of its affiliates. Isn't that right? I don't know. Okay. And it is, it is contrary to Apple's culture, as you put it, to retaliate against people. Yes, yeah, I stand by that. Okay. Um, you said uh, earlier today that you believe that consumers uh, value the um, app review process that Apple uh, engages in. Is that right? They review the, they uh, like the output of it, which is safer, more secure, and more privacy. Right, that's a fair enough qualification. Um, and you, you believe it's important for Apple to uh, curate the app store, correct? I do, yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, you believe it gives uh, customers trust and confidence in what they're getting from the app store. I do. Now, how do we call a, a store with 1.8 million apps curated? Uh, you still have to, they have to all live up to the rules. So cu curation is, at least in, in, uh, in the dictionary, uh, something that's carefully gathered and sifted and chosen and organized, right? Like a museum exhibit. Is that the ordinary meaning of the word as you understand it? Uh, I take it that that's the Webster definition that you use. Right? Okay. And, and does that accord with your understanding of the word, sir? Curation? No. Okay. But it's not a good description of a 1.8 million app store, is it, to say it's curated? I, I disagree. So Apple has curated something large and gives you the curate something that's small. So Apple has carefully gathered and chosen the apps, all 1.8 million of them in the App Store. And they'll make sure that they adhere to the guidelines of the App Store. Right. But you haven't gone through and selected and chosen and made editorial decisions about which ones you think are valuable for consumers and which ones maybe aren't, aren't as good, right? I think you're confusing curation and featuring. Well, I'm, I'm not, sir. I'm, I, I asked you just a question about whether that's something that you do. You don't go through and make editorial judgments about which apps do and don't belong in the store on the basis of 
whether they're good or fun or interesting or no, we, like that. we feature apps. Sir, I, I understand you feature them. Right. I'm asking about whether you let them into the store on that basis or not. No, we're not passing a moral judgment okay. on them. If that's the case. No, not just a moral judgment. You're not making decisions about, um, well, curation. You're not picking apps that you think are ones that people will like more, for example, or ones that will be of interest to people of a particular, um, uh, uh, who are interested in a particular type of activity, right? You're, you're just taking uh, a whole bunch of apps that come your way and deciding which ones comply with the guidelines. We're so deciding which ones are part of the guidelines and we're applying the guidelines uh, on an egalitarian basis. Right. And you're aware though there are other app stores out there that do in fact engage in more curation in the form of making judgment about which apps to have and not have on the store based on contact, correct? I, I don't know. Um, well, you, are you familiar with um, uh, good old games, for example? No. Okay. Um, you familiar with an uh, app store called Slide Me? No. Um, are you aware that there can be stores with a kind of subject matter focus that can attract people tailored to their individual interests? I, I don't know such an app store. Right. Well, there's certainly not one on, on the iPhone, right? No, I disagree. There's one app store on the iPhone, sir, correct? One app store that we recommend different apps for people. Well, I understand that, but there's just one app store on the iPhone. There's only one app store. Okay. And the only person who can make recommendations on the app store is Apple, right? Anybody can write about any app out in the wild. Sure, but the only people who can feature an app on the app store is exactly. people who work at Apple. That's correct. Right. Okay. This is a breaking point. Of course. All right, we will be standing in recess for 20 minutes. Mr. Cook, you may not speak to any lawyer, any party, anyone about your testimony, given that you're currently on cross-examination. I'm sure you have plenty to do during these 20 minutes. <laughs> do you. not do anything relative to your testimony. You understand? Thank you. Thank you. We'll stand in recess for 20 minutes. Court is in session. Come to order. Okay. We are back on the record with the record will reflect that Mr. Cook's on the stand. Mr. Bornstein is at the podium. Present. You may continue. Seems like I finished wrestling the binders. Right, Mr. Cook, um, before the break, we were talking about uh, users value in the App Store. You call that an, an app review. I'll just ask you a fresh question. I was just setting the stage. So it, it is your um, uh, view that users want Apple to curate the App Store. Is that fair? Yes. Um, and that, that users value the fact that Apple uh, engages in that exercise, yes? Yes. And in fact, you believe that users pay Apple to make decisions for them. Is that correct? I believe when they buy an iPhone, they expect certain decisions to be made with them so that it things become simple and not complex. Right. You, you, do you believe that users pay Apple to make decisions for them? It's probably not exactly the way I would say it, or, or are you taking something out of context? Well, let's uh, take a look at your deposition. Yeah. Um, Your Honor, do you have a copy? I believe I do. And I'm... Uh, looking, Your Honor, at, uh, do you have a copy, sir? Uh, is it in one of the binders? Or? May Mr. Karen approach with a copy, Your Honor? For the witness. You, you may. And actually, I don't think you gave it to me, but maybe the Apple folks did. I'll tag one if you would like. Yeah, I do need it. Thank you. Page one. Uh, page 224, beginning at line 15. Okay. Well, so far, we've 
you stated something consistent. You can ask another foundational question. I'll do it this way, Your Honor. Um, so when, when people buy an iPhone and spend a thousand dollars or whatever it is on an iPhone, you do at Apple decide for them that they cannot download apps directly from the developer to their own phone. Correct? You do. You decide for them that they cannot go to a third party store other than your app store to get an app for their phone. Is that right? Other than web apps. Okay, they can, they can do web apps themselves. The, the only way, you, you decide for them that the only way they can get a native app is through your app store. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so do people really value Apple's curation and Apple's app store? If there are multiple stores, people could still go shop at Apple, correct? Well, I would promise of buying that iPhone would be gone. Okay. So, uh, the question, the question, sir, is if there are multiple stores on the iPhone, and people really value the service that Apple provides in curating the store, people who value it could go shop at your store. Correct? It seems like a decision that they shouldn't have to make. So, people can make that decision if they like your store and they value what you're providing, then they can go shop at your store. And if they want something else, then they can make the choice to go somewhere else, right? When they buy an iPhone today, they buy something. When they buy an iPhone today, they just they buy something that just works. Right, sir. And, and it's is it your uh, is it your understanding that people customers don't understand the difference between the Apple App Store and a third party store if it were available on the phone? I think they buy into a total ecosystem when they buy an iPhone. Right, the question is whether they would understand the difference, sir. Would they understand the difference? I don't know. All right, well, right now, for example, you have your app store on the phone, and you also have a Safari browser, correct? Yeah. And as you said, people who want to get web apps can go to their Safari browser and get them from any developer they choose, correct? That's correct. And they can also surf on, uh, on a website and find all kinds of um, uh, horrible content uh, on the web, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you trust that your consumers know the difference between an app that comes from the app store and an app or content that comes from their browser, correct? I do. Right. And you don't know, however, whether people can tell the difference between your app store and a third-party app store with other branding, right? That's your testimony. You don't know if people could tell. They've never had to do it before. Right. So you just they can't bought be... into something that's an ecosystem that just works. And so you just can't be sure if people would be able to make that distinction. Is that your I, I'm saying I don't know. Right. And you don't know whether Apple's vast marketing machine can educate consumers about the difference between its app store and other stores that might be available. Is that right? Seems like a complexity they shouldn't have to worry about. Um, if there were another app store or app stores available, Apple would have to actually compete and persuade users that it had the best offering, right? You'd have to differentiate in some way. I, I don't know what we would do. Correct. You'd have to differentiate in some way. You testified earlier today to Ms. Maya that no one else would be as motivated as Apple to provide a safe and secure store. Is that right? Yes, I believe that. And you believe that no third party could do as good a job as Apple in providing a safe and secure store. Is that right? That's correct but you have no idea if that's true on the iPhone because no one else has ever had the opportunity to do that, right? It's an experiment I wouldn't want to run. But, and, and therefore, sir, you have no idea whether a third party could do a better job than Apple because you've never given anybody the opportunity. Isn't that right? I'm giving you my business judgment. Right. That's your judgment. And the market could come to a different judgment. Isn't that right? If there were a market that you permitted to exist. The customers that have reached out to me on this topic are all uniformly 
they want it to stay like it is because they like the safety, security, and privacy. And uh, developers are in the same boat. All the developers who reached out to you like things the way it is too. I think uh, some developers do love the way it is today. And, and then you obviously have one that doesn't. More than one, sir, isn't that right? There's a few. Just a few? That's, that's your understanding? There are just a few developers who don't like the current system? That's the only one that I know, yes. Okay, well, how, how many developers, sir, have come in to testify on Apple's behalf in this trial? I, I don't know. Did it surprise you to hear the answer is zero? No, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't see that it would be uh, that it is a natural way to include them. Okay. Fortunately, we, you have excellent counsel, Seth, who I'm sure could figure that out if there were developers who are interested in supporting the system. Um, but as it stands, there's nobody else who has ever been able to provide an app store on the iPhone. And there's no way to know, other than your business judgment, whether somebody could do a good job. Fair? No, I disagree. Okay. Let's I disagree turn, let's turn to privacy, sir. So you can explain this to Ms. Moye. She will give you the opportunity. Um, let's turn to privacy, which you've talked about uh, a fair bit today. And you said that Apple, um, or you, consider it one of the most important issues of the century, correct? Yes. And you said in other contexts, I don't think you said it today, that Apple believes privacy is a basic human right. Yes. Um, is it also the case that Apple believes that its stance on privacy is uh, a differentiator in the market for its products? Island on this one. I think we care more than others do. And do and you think that helps you sell iPhones and other products to consumers? I think there's some people that really want that and therefore buy an iPhone because of it. Yeah, and, and it's something that you... Um, at Apple market to people to say, hey, we offer better privacy than some of our competitors, and that's a reason you should prefer our device. Isn't that right? For people that want privacy. Yeah. Um, there are uh, uh, other app stores that could make a similar commitment to privacy. Fair? I haven't seen any that do. That wasn't a question. There are other people who could, right? There's no monopoly on privacy on Apple's part, correct? I don't know that anybody would. They yeah. haven't thus far. Apple doesn't have a unique ability to safeguard privacy, does it? Sure it does. Apple doesn't have a unique ability to decide, other than through its control of the system, which apps and which apps are not safe and uh, uh, protective of user data and privacy, does it? And these are just 40,000 a week. And so there's a lot of work that goes on in terms of doing that. And there's a lot of expertise that you build up over numerous years. The 40,000 that you reject each week, they're not all on privacy grounds, are they? No, they would be for various different they're things. They're on a variety of grounds. And people who, if they had a choice to value privacy, could decide to choose Apple because they value it, or they could decide to choose somebody else's app store if they thought somebody else was doing a better job. Correct? Seems hypothetical. Okay, well, there, there are circumstances, sir, in which Apple's record on privacy is not perfect. Is that fair? Our record is not perfect. Right. There are, for example, situations in which Apple's stance on privacy does not coincide with its financial interest. Correct? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, so, for example, there's a document in your binder which is labeled DX4400. Which binder? Uh, the one that I gave you, number one, I hope. Oh, this is an evidence one. Uh, what, what was the is number? The small binder or the big binder? DX4400, sir. Mr. Bernstein, which binder is it in? It's number one, as I said. Let me know when you're there, please, Mr. Cook. 
I'm there. Sorry, you said you're there? Yes. Okay. Can you beat me? Um, DX 4400. document that we discussed some of Mr. Schiller the other day, so we don't need to spend uh, uh, too much time on it. Do you recognize what this is? No. Do you recognize, uh, are you aware that there is an app store and privacy uh, policy that is made available to users? Sure. Okay. And um, maybe you can put this on the, on the screen, Mr. Webb, so it will help me as well. Um, if, uh, if you look at the top of the second uh, page, uh, I guess, actually, I guess it's on the bottom of the very first page. There's something that says uh, improving the stores. Do you see that? I see improving the stores. And it indicates that to improve the experience in the stores, Apple will collect information about the usage of the stores, including when you open or close the store, what content you search for, and the content you view and download. Do you see that? I do. And uh, there are other, so when I go to my phone, let my iPhone says, when I go to my phone and I open the store, Apple will log the fact that I have opened it at that point in time, right? Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. So you don't know whether when I type in a search, like um, for, for running or um, some other activity, that Apple will log that so that it can provide personalized ads to me in the store and other information that's tailored for me based on my searches. Yeah, I'm not familiar there. Okay. Um, let's try a different uh, uh, circumstance then where Apple's, uh, but, so somebody, let me, before I do that, so, so somebody else mm -hmm. who, were gonna, who was going to create an app store could choose to collect less data about its users than Apple does, correct? I don't know. I think we generally collect the minimum amount that we can. And someone else could choose not to collect, for example, information about what content you search for and the content that you view and the content that you download. Correct? If they did, they couldn't make recommendations. Yeah, but someone else could make that choice if they value privacy, sir. Right? It seems very hypothetical. Yeah. But somebody could do that. You've chosen to get this information so that you can make recommendations. Somebody else could make a different choice. Isn't that right? I don't know. Okay. Um, so let's talk about another circumstance related to privacy, which is your iCloud service. Apple has an iCloud service, correct? We do. And uh, users can store data uh, for a fee in, in iCloud, correct? They could also do it for free, depending on how much data they have, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, in China, the iCloud service is operated by a Chinese company called GCBD. Is that right? Yes, in London. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And GCBD is a company that is uh, owned, at least in part, by a Chinese government entity, correct? They're a state-owned entity. Okay. Uh, and you have uh, a user agreement, which we can uh, think of in, in your binder, PF1678. Which binder? Same binder, number one. And you can call that up on the screen, Mr. Rex. This is uh, the public document for which there's no confidentiality issue. Right? Mr. Speaker, are you familiar with the iCloud operated by GCBD terms and conditions? Um, peripherally, yeah. I'm sorry, you said peripherally. Peripherally, got it. Um, Your Honor, we'd move the F1678 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, this document, sir, you can see in the um, second line, uh, says that it governs your use of the iCloud product, software, services, and websites, correct? 
Yes. And if you go uh, to uh, further down on the page, uh, you will see in the um, kind of last sentence of the second paragraph, it reads that when iCloud is enabled, your content will be automatically sent to and stored by GCBD, correct? Yes, that's what it says. And so users content is sent to and stored by a Chinese state-owned entity for these iCloud users, correct? Correct. And the um, data can be accessed uh, and shared with GCBD, correct? Uh, I'm not sure what the rules of that are. So, um, Apple also uh, complies with requests from the Chinese government to take down apps off of the App Store. Isn't that right? Occasionally, we have apps on the store that are illegal that we have to remove. So, for example, Apple has taken down news apps because they are contrary to Chinese government policy, correct? Some. Uh, and, in fact, that's not an unusual occurrence, is it? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a regular occurrence. Uh, well, let's take a look at PX 1659, please. Now, let's not put this one up on the screen because it was uh, marked as highly confidential and we don't have Apple's position on this. So this is not the document that Judge Hickson dealt with? This is not the document that he dealt with, no. Right. And then I, I suppose while Mr. Cook is looking at the document, I could I could use guidance from the court on whether you would prefer that I just save this for a sealed session, or whether um, and maybe guidance from Apple uh, on whether we need to I've maintain confidentiality. It. I've never seen it. So okay. I don't have a position. Um, Your Honor, I think we have designated the confidential, and so I believe it should be done in a court in a sealed session. Okay, yeah. that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll save this now for, for confidentiality reasons, Mr. Cook. Right. Okay. You do understand you're under an hour total, right? I'm sorry? Your team is under an hour total in the time left in trial. Yes, I do. Thank you, Ann. Um, Mr. Cook, when, when Apple agrees to um, share user data with a Chinese state entity, and when Apple agrees to take apps down off the app store. That's a situation where its commitment to privacy and its financial interests are in conflict with one another, correct? Yeah. So you, you're not thinking about the money, to use your phrase from earlier today, when you choose to comply with these Chinese requirements. Is that right? We have to uh, comply with the laws in each of the jurisdictions that we are uh, operating on. So if there were multiple app stores and there were direct distribution, governments would not be able to come to Apple to one source to engage in this kind of censorship, would they? Uh, if there were multiple app stores, they would go to multiple people, I suppose. If you'd rather... Well, because, because of the Android stores, they do the same thing with the Android stores. Well, be, because People pay you to make decisions for them. Governments can come to you to make decisions for their citizens. Isn't that right? Governments have the right to pass laws for their citizens. Well, Apple doesn't have to follow or agree with or comply with laws that it believes to be unjust and inconsistent with its commitment to privacy, does it? We have to comply with the laws in the jurisdictions that we operate in. Sure, if you make a decision to continue to operate in those jurisdictions. Yes, yeah, I strongly believe it's in the best interest of the people there that we do operate. Yes, you said that previously, that it's better to be there uh, and rather than yell at the sidelines, I think is your phrase, correct? Uh, it sounds like something I would say. Okay. Um, not every company makes that decision, though, right? Some companies choose to take a principled stand of another sort and not um, engage in that kind of uh, decision-making. 
Yeah. I know of nobody in the smartphone business that is not selling in China. Uh, so let's um, take a look, if you would, at uh, Exhibit 16, PX 1667. You have that, sir? Uh, I do. Okay. And uh, this is an email that went to Mark Grimm at Apple. Do you know Mr. Grimm? I do not. Okay. Um, you can see uh, further on the, the bottom of the page, there's an email uh, from Mr. Sweeney at Epic to, uh, to Mr. Grimm. This is Dear Mark. Do you see that? I see the Dear Mark. Okay. I think that you've never seen this uh, I, document before? No, I'm not on copy of it, and I've never seen it. All right. Well, let, let me just direct you then to the second page. Uh, the last paragraph there, you can put it on the screen, Mr. Rad, if you can. There is an email from Mr. Sweeney that says, there are deep perils in Apple operating the only allowed software distribution facility on iOS, as it allows repressive regimes to demand developer participation in their surveillance and censorship programs, using Apple as a proxy for enforcement. This peril does not exist on other general computing platforms such as Android, Windows, Mac, and Linux, in which users have the freedom to install software directly from sources of their own choosing. You see that? I see it written. Okay. And, but, but this concept never made it to you uh, at Apple. I've never seen this note before. And have you heard this concept before, sir? No. And are you aware, sir, that Epic took a position where it refused to engage uh, in, a, uh, in a business context where it was going to be required to uh, compromise user privacy and data. I'm not aware. Okay. Let's look quickly, if you would, at the first page of the document where Mr. Sweeney writes to Mr. Grimm at Apple. We've looked into the requirements for obtaining a Vietnam license for Fortnite under Decree 72 and have decided that we can't ethically comply. Obtaining the license would force Epic to take action violating the basic human rights of our users and would impose censorship over Epic's own right to creative expression. Do you see that? I do not. Where, where are you? I am on the bottom of the first page, and it's on the screen in front of you as well, sir. I see it. Right. And you weren't aware that Epic had taken this, uh, taken this position? No, I'm not. And I guess you disagree. You think Epic should, should be in Vietnam and... And, and try to affect change rather than yell from the sidelines. Uh, I don't take a judgment on what other people should do. Fair enough. Um, is it your view that there are no benefits whatsoever to uh, users in being allowed to download software from outside the Mac App Store on your Macintosh computers? I think the Mac and the iPhone are very different. So question though is, do you see any benefit at all to users of the Macintosh in being allowed to download apps from outside the Mac App Store? Are there any benefits at all? Today, not all of the apps are on the Mac App Store. And so there will be an availability uh, point there. And do you think there are any benefits um, to users in having a design that enables them to um, choose apps that are outside the Mac App Store. I think it would be a lot safer if we did it the other way. So the, the, the consumer choice element is not in your view a benefit to Mac users. Well, today, not all apps are on the store. And so there might be a user benefit in having access to something that's not on the floor. Are you aware, sir, that your counsel, ooh, is in high demand. Question. Are you aware, sir, that your counsel in this case has made the argument that uh, accepting Epic's position would have the effect of also 
condemning the business models of uh, the various game consoles. Of condemning? Of, of uh, finding them to be unlawful. It would make sense to me that that would be the case. Uh, you, you don't know one way or the other whether council has made that argument. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and when I'm talking about the game consoles, you understand me to mean Xbox and PlayStation and the Switch, yes? Right. right. And our Xbox is owned by Microsoft. Yes. And Microsoft, are you aware, is one of the third parties that came into court to testify here? I am aware. And Microsoft, the Microsoft witness who came is someone who had responsibilities for the Xbox. Are you aware of that? I haven't listened to the testimony. Well, so Microsoft itself did not come in, as I understood it. She came in in her personal capacity. That's correct. I, yes, Your Honor. There was a, an individual from Microsoft who came in and testified. Um, he was someone who had responsibility for the Xbox in her job, correct? I, I have not listened to the testimony. Okay. And you weren't aware one way or the other whether there was such a person. Is that correct? I knew somebody from Microsoft was coming in. Yeah. Um, This person from Microsoft who's come in to testify, fair to assume that at least she doesn't believe that accepting Epic's position would wind up dooming the Xbox business in its current model? Just to the foundation. Who's going? So um, you uh, testified before, we talked about your testimony at the House Judiciary Committee um, last summer already, that's yes, correct? Yes, you brought up a clip from it. Yeah. Um, another question you were asked uh, at the House Judiciary Committee was what's to stop Apple from increasing its commission to 50%? Do you recall that? Right. Could you point me to it? Sure. I'll ask Mr. Rudd once again to play the, the clip of uh, TX 1725. What's to stop Apple from increasing its commission to 50%? We, sir, we have never increased commissions in the store since the first day it operated in 2008. And so that was your testimony in Congress? Yeah. Okay. And you said that we've never increased commissions in the store. That that was your testimony. Correct? Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. And it's true that Apple's never actually increased the commission rate in the store, but Apple has expanded the scope of transactions to which that commission applies, correct? That's the product features, if that's what you mean. Well, for example, sir, prior to the launch of the IAT uh, system in 2009, developers were able to offer in-app commerce in their own apps without paying a commission to Apple, correct? That's my knowledge. All right, well, let's take a look, sir, at PX1701 in your binder. You have 1701? I do. Okay. And do you know Ms. Pruden, who is the recipient of this email? I do. Okay. Uh, and what's her role at Apple? She works in the worldwide developer relations area. Okay. And Ms. Pruden, in February of 2009, receives uh, uh, this email regarding Skyscape. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. And if you look on the second uh, page of, uh, of the document, you'll see it's a little hard to read, I understand, but you'll see a series of screenshots from the Skyscape app. Do you see that? I, I see it, but I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can have Mr. Uh, it's possible to blow it uh, up. Blow up that piece of it on the screen. Let's, let's just uh, keep it to that page and you can focus in so you don't have anything confidential here. 2009. And I'm on page two, Mr. Rudd. No, okay. 
Do we not have that one? Okay. Well, I'll ask you, sir, I'll, I'll show you the part I'm looking at. It may take a little bit of squinting, but fortunately, you've got your glasses. So you have, um, you can use the Elmo. Or school. I, I think we can get through it, Your Honor. Okay. So thank you. Um, in the, the top left corner of page two, do you see there's a section that says violations? Under the word skyscape? I see it. All right. And it indicates that there's a store within the app. App on iPhone is free, and then you purchase all your content directly from Skyscape from within the app. Do you see that? I see it written. Okay. And are you aware that that was something that developers could do, in fact, in February of 2009, before the launch of IAP? Get some foundation. Overruled. You can answer if you know. Uh, I don't know. When I, as I look at this today, it's not clear that it's on the store. It looks like it's going through a review. Well, let's look then. So, first of all, I believe 1701 is evidence wrong. Um, no objection, subject to our TSA reservation one, pushing to the computer being prepared by third party. Well, this looks like a business record. Why is it not a business record? Here, whether this is Apple generated content with Sky, Sky State versus a submission by Sky State and created by them. The cover email is certainly a business record. Okay. Uh, Admit as if the limitations that I have on all the other hearsay documents attached. That's fine, Your Honor, though I, I would argue that Sky State certainly wasn't the one who indicated that there was a violation. It didn't make much sense. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> I understand. And like I said, you know, we have rules in litigation, we follow the rules. Absolutely, Your Honor. Um, so let, let me turn you around, giving your uh, answer, sir, to 1709, CF 1709. Do you have that? Yes, it's in front of me. Great. And do you know the recipient of this uh, email, Mr. Hahn, C.K. Hahn? Yes, he was a longtime employee that I believe recently retired. Uh, and uh, the email from Mr. Hahn, referring to an app called Unbound Medicine, states that the Unbound Medicine app used to have an order form within the app which was actually a web kit view loading an optimized website. They have, as instructed by us, changed that. So now their app instead launches Safari and the customer proceeds on the Unbound Medicine website. Do you see that? I do see it. Okay, so uh, safe to say this app at least is up on the store, correct? Thank you for our foundation. Uh, it's not clear to me that it is. Uh, down at the bottom of this page, uh, sort of a three paragraph email. Do you see that? Um, is it on the second page? No, or? First, first page, sir. First page. It says, Have you had a chance to step through the app as it is now appearing on the App Store? I see that. And then it goes on to say, It looks like it continues to violate the T's and C's, specifically with in app commerce. Do you see that? I, I see it, yeah. Okay. Does this refresh your recollection, sir, that in-app commerce was available in apps in 2009 before the launch of the IAP functionality? No, it doesn't refresh my memory. Your Honor, we use PX 1709 into evidence. No objection. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. And incidentally, sir, um, this says that Apple instructed Unbound Medicine to change the app so it instead launches Safari for a purchase. See that in the top email? I, I see it in writing. Okay. 
So, so that's like Apple hanging that, that sign saying, go purchase this at Best Buy, isn't it? Saying, go, go buy this in Safari instead of doing it in the app. I'm not familiar with this email at all. I'm not on copy of it. Okay. But you are aware now, sir, that, that this would not be permitted to have a link to go to Safari to make a purchase, correct, under your current rules? That's correct. Right. And your counsel asked you also about emails and whether you can communicate by email to, to consumers, correct? She did. And you're, you're aware that your current guideline states that apps cannot, either within the app or through communications sent to points of contact obtained from account registration within the app, encourage users to use a purchasing method other than in-app purchase. You aware of that rule? As I testified earlier, you can mass market. Right, but you can't mass market to emails that were obtained from account registration within the app, correct? No, it's true, yeah. So if I, well, so is this an incorrect uh, guideline that's now no longer in force? I think we may interpret that differently than you do. Right, well, if somebody signs up to an app um, right. and shares their email, through account registration in the app, you can't then send that person uh, a communication encouraging them to purchase elsewhere, correct? You can't do something like uh, one day you get the uh, email address and then the next day you always send that person a uh, direct marketing. But you can, you can direct market to your base, which includes that email, assuming the customer gave you the email. Right, as long as it doesn't come from account registration in the app. You have to get the developer has to get them to some other source, correct? If, if the developer gets the email from the customer, right, then they can use it. Right, but if they get it through registering on the app, they can't. I'm not sure what you mean by registering on the app. So the, 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 language, um, the language will speak for itself in your guidelines here. Um, let me move to a, to a different subject. Actually, Your Honor, I think I should probably reserve some time for the sealed section. I was going to say you're, you're at 33 minutes. So yeah. I'll, I'll reserve some time for the sealed section, and, and I'll talk to witness. All right. So uh, you want to do the cross first with respect to yes, Your Honor. the public session? Yes, that would be. Go ahead, Stephanie. Thank you. Hello there. Just a few questions on subjects that were just covered by Ethics Council. Let's start first with a questioning about search ads. Was the introduction of search ads intended to help with um, app discovery, sir? It was. And when that search ad feature was offered at WWDC in 2016, were there other um, features that were offered to improve discovery? My recollection was that that was the year that we uh, announced the Today tab, which was a, uh, a way to, to do editorial and feature ads. Um, I think it also changed the recommendation engine and some other things that would help in discovery as well. Was there a filtering of installed apps that was announced at WWDC also in 2016, do you recall? A filtering of installed apps, I, I don't recall. Was there an effort made, and we talked about app discovery in the 2015-2016 timeframe, uh -huh. to um, improve the number of apps in the store to filter. Uh, um, that's, yeah. that's the question I'm thinking. Yes, I think we went through quite a uh, process to, to uh, take out some of the apps in the store, which would inherently improve discovery as well. 
Um, was there at some point a game tag added to the app store? Yes, the separation of games and apps was also another way to uh, increase discovery. Thank you, sir. And then let's talk about um, the questioning about the video agreement. Does Apple have agreements with other search engines as well? We do. And do those agreements have similar revenue to the Google agreement? I, I believe so. And why does Apple make Google the default? A search engine. Thank you, sir. Um, let's talk a little bit about the financial documents. 2385 is in my binder. 2392 is in my binder. And then there's a 2391 in the epic binder. I've got two, three, eight, five in front of me. Just that high. Maybe let's start with two, three, nine, one, which is an epic big binder. There, okay. I think binder one. It's a really big one. The one Mr. Borenstein was just asking me about. Okay, I'm on 2391. Now, Mr. Bornstein asked you whether this 2391 was the same kind of document that we had looked at, 2385 and 2392. Do you recall that line of question? I, I think he asserted it was, but I don't really see it like that. Could you explain, is it the same kind of document? No, this is a uh, quarterly PNL update for the company. And yes, it has some other things in it, but, but this is more of a regular document versus this other thing was a benchmarking kind of document looking at other companies and their operating margins and that sort of thing. Thank you, sir. And who would be 2391? If you can recall. Um, I don't recall this exact meeting, but generally this would have a broader audience to it than the other one. Thank you, sir. And there was questioning about whether 2385 and 2392 were regular presentations. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, are there any other presentations like that that you're aware of? I don't recall any. I think and, it was the first time that it happened. And both of those were dated in September 2019? I think so, yes. I haven't seen any documents like that since September 20th. I don't recall. Mr. Bernstein asked you a lot of questions about whether you understood what ethics expert Mr. Ned Barnes had done in his expert work. Do you recall that? Yes. Did Mr. Ned Barnes work at Apple in the 2019 time period? That's my Did Mr. Ned Barnes provide any input? into the three profitability documents we looked at, 2385, 2391, and 2392. No. Who, sir, do you believe is in a better position to give truthful testimony to the court on the meaning of those three documents, you or Mr. Ned Bond? I, I am. I was in the meeting. Do those documents contain fully burdened P&L information for the App Store as a standalone business unit? They do not. And are you concerned at all that Mr. Ned Barnes came in and said that he could compare some numbers in at least two of those documents, 2385 and 2392, to publicly reported documents? I don't see how that would be possible because the publicly reported numbers are more gross margin at the services level, not uh, operating margin per service type. 
You were asked also some questions about often epic the ability to come back into the app store after it deliberately breached its agreements with Apple. You recall that this yeah. one? And I believe you explained that you considered that conduct to be malicious. Is that right, sir? That's right. Do you still consider it to be malicious? I do. Why did Apple offer Epic the opportunity to come back into the store? Because we thought it would be the right thing for the user and that the user was being put in the middle here of a business dispute. And uh, that was a terrible thing to do from the, from the beginning. And so we thought the business dispute should be settled uh, in, in court if it had to, like we like wound up, uh, but not have the user uh, suffer from that. Was the offer that, made, that was made to Epic Epic, you can come back into the app store but continue malicious conduct? No, of course not. They would have to commit to uh, abiding by the rules. You were asked some questions about a Schedule 2 to the developer program license agreement. I think it's number 2943. Do you remember that? It's in the big Epic binding. Let me just make sure that I can call it correctly. Oh, this is the one I was asked questions about uh, termination. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I have it in front of me. Do you know whether or not Japanese law requires the addition of the language that Mr. Bornstein asked you about? Section Foundation. Uh, so, Lathan Foundation, just thank you. So, do you know what motivated the changes to that license agreement provision that Mr. Bornstein asked you about? My understanding is there was something in Japanese law that required it. Thank you. You were asked about whether other companies could perform app review as well as Apple. Do you remember that line of question? Yes. So do you believe Apple has a unique ability to protect user privacy on iOS devices? I strongly feel that we do. Can you explain why, sir? Well, we've been at the app review for since 2008. We've built up a number of tools and we've built up the, the human expertise to uh, evaluate it. We, we sort of we know a lot of things to look for. Uh, and in terms of the operating system itself, uh, I think the results speak for itself in terms of the, the malware that hits iOS versus the malware that hits other, other operating systems. Thank you, sir. And then you were asked some questions about China and Chinese law. Do you remember that? I do. So does Apple have an option whether it can or cannot decide to follow Chinese law? No. Does any company, to your knowledge, have the option to defy Chinese law? No, and it's, it's a little bit more here. We ship the same iPhone uh, in China that we ship everywhere else in the world. It has the same encryption on it. Uh, our message is the same, FaceTime is the same. And, and, and so the, the product, other than the cloud piece is the same. And you were asked about complying with requests to take down from the Chinese government. But you will call that line of question. I did. And in that situation, what is your understanding of why the Chinese government is making that request? Uh, because in their view, it's not lawful. And are you asked to take down apps based on legal request in other jurisdictions as well. Yes. And do you make any difference in determining whether you're going to follow the law in China versus any other jurisdiction? No, we have to follow the law in each jurisdiction that we're in. And is, is it your understanding that that's the same for all companies? Yes. Does Apple take steps to protect user privacy in China? Yes, of course. We have the same app tracking transparency that I reviewed earlier. That's in China. The intelligent tracking prevention is in China. The app nutrition label is in China. The bulk of the things we do are the same everywhere around the world. 
who were asked some questions about whether developers can communicate with their customers about other payment options. Do you remember that, Mr. Yeah. Johnson? Yeah. And what you explained to the court, can developers send email communications to their customers? Yes, of course, as long as they have the email address, as long as the customer freely gives up their email address. Thank you, sir. And you were asked about the availability of in-app commerce on the App Store prior to the introduction of the IAP functionality. Do you remember that? I do. And you were shot at God's minutes 1709, I believe. Yeah. And that document, the third paragraph from the bottom, has the following language. Have you had a chance to step through the app that is, as it is now appearing on the app store? It looks like it continues to violate the T's and C's, especially with in-app comments. You see that language? I do. Does that language suggest to you that in-app commerce was allowed on the app store? No. Sustained. Mm -hmm. and, and what is your testimony? What is your understanding as to whether in-app commerce was allowed on the app store prior to the introduction of IAP? That it was not allowed. Have you seen any document here today that causes you to change that judgment? No, not at all. You were also asked about a Skyscape app. I have to find the exhibit number. It's exhibit number 1701. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Now, Mr. Blanstein asked you some questions about references to in-app commerce in that document. Can you call that? Correct. I'd like you to take another, a look at another document related to Skyscape. This is PX1813. It's not in the binder, sir. I'm going to have to bring you a copy of the court permission. Yes. Thank you. Do you have that document for PX one eight one three? I do. And this is dated February 9, 2009, is that correct? That's correct. And it also copies Ms. Sean Cody, who's referenced in the other document? It does. If you would turn to the page dot three, do you see the language there, Skyscape? need to remove in-app commerce capabilities, working to have them change their model for providing medical reference. You see that? I do. Look at page 1813.2. You see the language challenges. Modality has started to lose some bigger licensing deals to Skyscape who sell content from within their free app, working with Skyscape on updating their app to be compliant with current T and C. You see that line? I do. One other document that I want to ask you about and before I do, do you see messages of support from developers, Mr. Cook? Yes, of course. 
And are you familiar with SNAP? Right. Okay, I'd like to show you another document, DX5577. You want to talk to the coach with me? Thank you. So do you recognize this into do you recognize this, I'm sorry, as a publication dated May 21st, 2020? Yes. From today. And what is the caption of this article? Your Honor, I object. This is a news article that came out while Mr. Cook was on the witness stand. We've never seen it before, and it's your thing. Your Honor, Mr. Cook was asked about how developers respond. He was also asked why no developers had shown up. I think this is proper redirect in light of this line of questioning. Thank you, sir. Suspended. There's other evidence in the record. Um, Your Honor, we would like to move PX1813 into evidence. It was already in. Is that it in? Yes, it is. Thank you, Your Honor. One second, please. Do I have this one? One, eight, one, three. Uh, we've already moved it into evidence, so we don't need to deal with it anymore. Thank you, sir. Okay, we passed the witness. We cross on those topics. Your Honor, before I begin the cross, I was advised that I neglected to move PX 1667 into evidence. This was the email exchange between Mr. Sweeney and Mr. Graham relating to Vietnam. 1667 is admitted. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cook, can you look uh, again briefly at uh, PX 2391? This is in the binder that I gave you. December 2019 uh, presentation from your corporate financial planning and analysis group, correct? Yes, I see it. Uh, and this one you said was different from the ones in September, correct? Yes. But it does have at the back, beginning at page dot 104, the same type of profitability analysis that we saw in uh, PX2385, correct? Could you give me the page number? Begins at dot one zero four. You have that now, sir? I do. And this is the same kind of profitability analysis that was discussed at your meeting with Mr. Ministry and Ms. Casey in September of 2019, correct? Yeah, the other one had uh, a benchmarking exercise on it, which showed a bunch of different companies. True, and it had this information that appears here as well, just one quarter back, correct? I'd have to look back at that one again. All right, but th and this one, the December one, you said, wasn't just me and Mr. Mayfield and Ms. Casey, you said this one went to a broader audience, correct? The first part of this one. 
So you're saying only the first part of the document went to the broader audience and this profitability part got cut off when it was distributed to everybody else? I, I don't know. Okay. But I know the long range forecast is a for people. Because yeah. we don't know whether this went to the broader audience or not. I don't. Despite your testimony earlier. But it went to a broader audience. I testified audience. earlier to the earlier document. Okay. To the, the, to the previous document. Mr. Cook, earlier you testified that you didn't know about the addition of the language on termination to section 7.1 of schedule two, correct? I didn't know what it was done. But you also said you hadn't seen the language before, correct? I think I have seen the language. Okay. And you didn't know why the change had happened, correct? I was reminded with council that we had a change because of uh, a regulatory issue in Japan. Right. That, that was something you didn't remember when you were on the stand before and you remembered only when council prompted you, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, staying on 2391, sir, take a look at um, uh, uh, dot 86, please. Do you have that page? I do. Right. And you testified in response to questions from Ms. Moyer that you have um, uh, search-related deals with companies other than Google, correct? Yes. Right. Now, if you look on dot eight six, you'll see about a uh, third of the way down is a line that says licensing. You see that? I do. And that's your search deals, correct? That's where the search deals that maybe have something else in it as well. I'm not sure. Okay. And I'm not going to read the numbers there, but you can see that the Google number is quite a bit larger than other licensing. Correct? Yes, it is. And the Google deal is far and away the largest of your search deals, correct? Yes, it is. The last document uh, I'll direct you to, so um, Ms. Moe said, uh, that there was, I believe, no document that reflected the fact that there was in-app commerce capability prior to 2009, that to, to the launch of IAC in 2009. Do you recall that? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then she read to you from TX1813 something that says uh, that Skyscape sells content from within their free app. Do you recall that? Uh, could you uh, give me the number again? Sure, PX1813.2. One eight one three. It was something that was my I handed you this. Oh. Yes. Okay. Right. And you see near the top of the second page. It says modality has started to lose some bigger licensing deals to Skyscape who sell content from within their free app. Do you see that? I see it. So it was possible at this time for apps like Skyscape to sell content within their free app. Correct? It was definitely against the rules. I have no idea whether they were doing it or not. Okay. Um, well, let's take a look then at, in my binder, yeah. PS1703. You have that? I do. Okay, and this one is another email that went to Ms. Pruden, who needs the steps, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, you can see the individual uh, who wrote this email, Mary Beth James, has an Apple email address, correct? She does. Right. Uh, and uh, what she writes to Ms. Pruden, you can see at the bottom, is that. Uh, uh, an individual associated with a Stanza app wants to know which of these three he should be using as his model. Do you see that? No, could you put them to the right place? It's the third to last paragraph on page one. I tried not to pronounce the gentleman's name, but it looks like Mark Pudamo. I see it. Okay. And according to Ms. James, 
this person wanted to know which of these three he should be using as his model. You see that? Yes, I see it. Okay. And then there are a couple of options, including the Amazon Kindle, which has free sample chapters of books with a buy now button enabling the transaction in the app with one click purchasing. You see that? I do see it. And Apple allowed the Amazon Kindle app to have purchasing within the app before the launch of IAP, correct? That's my foundation. Oh. That's my knowledge. Um, I have to try one more then, sir. But first, you want to use PX1703 in the No objection. No objection. No objection. No. Take a look, sir, then at uh, PX1714. I, I do. Okay. Now, this is in November of 2010 after the launch of IOT, correct? So I don't recall when IOT was launched. Okay. I'll make a representation to you, sir, that I believe it was launched in 2009. Does that sound at least plausible to you? Yeah, it seems like somewhere around there. Okay. And you can see in the top email here from Mr. Schumann. Do you remember who he is? I don't recall him, but I know that he had something to do with Apple G for a while. Okay. Um, and now this is now again after IAP has been announced. He writes, for ebooks, we allow them to do what Amazon's Kindle app does. They kick you out to their website to purchase the actual book, correct? I see the writing. I don't know whether it's correct or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, do, do you know whether at this point in time Apple's policy is to allow? Ebooks like Amazon to have users purchase from the web to get kicked out of the app and purchase from the web. This, this sounds like the um, reader rule today. Okay. And I don't recall exactly the dates on that, but the reader rule allows someone to buy off the platform and consume the content on the platform. Your Honor, I have nothing else within the scope of the examination. Okay. Saving for the sealed portion. All right. Uh, and that last exhibit, did you want it in? 17, yes, 17 yes. 14? Uh, yes, Your Honor, that's correct. In a minute. All right. We direct limited to the scope of this recross. I hate to ask you, but take one more look at PX2391. It's in Apple's binding, Mr. Cook. And if you go to page dot 104 in that big book, Um, there's a section of that document that refers to the services line of business. Is that correct? Starts on that page? Yeah. Was that portion of this document shared with any of the heads of the business units in that services line of business? Not to my knowledge. And there is a notation of the operating margin on page dot. 105 for the app store and for various other areas in the services line of business. Do you see that, sir? Yes. And just to be clear with the court, does that margin on that page reflect a fully burdened allocation of cost for the app store? It does not. Thank you, sir. Nothing more. Anything on that one question? No, oh, yeah. So, Mr. Uh, Cook, it was odd to me that you did not remember anything about that termination provision before the break. And it was only uh, by the 
prompting of the attorney's question that somehow you remembered it. What is it that you remembered, if anything? I remember something happening in Japan where we needed to make a change in the uh, termination clause. That's it? That's all you have? That's the extent of my memory. And at the beginning of your testimony, you indicated that uh, you wanted to focus on users. I've seen evidence that a significant portion of revenue from in-app purchases come from gamers. Have you seen evidence to that effect? I have your honor. Uh, and it's incredibly significant as compared to all other users, revenue is coming from gamers more than anyone else. Am I right in my current understanding? And, and you see all these binders, I still have to review them. The majority of the revenue on the app store comes from games. Okay. And in app purchases in particular, right? Correct. So, what is the problem? Well, I, I would say the other thing you said is you want to give users control. Is that right? That's right, for the data. So, what is the problem? with allowing users to have choice, especially in the gaming context, to find, uh, to have a cheaper option for content. I think they have a choice today. They have a choice between many different Android models, a smartphone or an iPhone, and that iPhone has a certain set of principles behind it in safety, the security, the privacy. But if they wanted to go and get a, a cheaper battle pack or cheaper v box uh, and they don't know that they've got that option, what is the problem with Apple giving them that option? Mm -hmm. At least that information that they can go and have a... Uh, you know, a, a different option for, for making purchases. If we allowed people to link out like that, we would, in essence, give up the, uh, our total return on our IP. Right, but, or, you, but you could also monetize it a different way, couldn't you? I mean, that is, the gaming industry seems to be generating a disproportionate amount of money relative to the IP that you are giving them and everybody else. In, in, in a sense, it's almost as if they're subsidizing everybody else. The, the bulk of the apps on the apps are free. That's right. And so you're right, there is some sort of subsidy there. However, the way that I look at that, Your Honor, is that by having such a large number of apps that are free on the store, it increases the traffic to the store dramatically. And so the benefit somebody gets that's charging is they get a much higher audience to, to sell to than they would otherwise if there weren't free apps there. So your so your logic then is that they don't get the customer base. So it, it's more of a customer base, not an IP then. It's both because we we need a return on our IP. I mean we have 150,000 APIs to to create and maintain and numerous developer tools and the customer service piece of, of uh, dealing with all these transactions. So there's a lot of... Right, but let me ask you. Um, sure. So banking apps. Uh, Wells Fargo is based here. I have, a well, I have multiple banking apps. I haven't paid for them. But I suspect what, other than the $99, you don't charge Wells Fargo, right? That's or right. Bank of America. That's right. Uh, but you're charging the gamers to subsidize Wells Fargo. Well, in the, in the gamer as an example, they're transacting on our platform. People are doing lots of things on their platform. So, so. But this is a digital transaction with a observable change in, in uh, currency. 
उसके Welcome to AT&T's teleconference service. Please enter your... To join the conference as the host, press star. Otherwise, press pound. At the tone, please speak your name. There are 351 participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as a participant. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. Your connection is now in listen-only mode. Proposition of competition is good. I think competition is great. We have fierce competition in our business. You don't have competition when those in-app purchases them. Sure. I mean, somebody could go, uh, if, they're on a, if they're a gamer, they can go uh, buy on the Sony uh, uh, PlayStation or the Microsoft Xbox or the Nintendo Switch. Well, only if they, only if they know, right? But, well, but that's up to the developer to communicate. Uh, and only if they decide to switch in terms of how they do things, right? Usually people have both. The issue with the um, one million dollar small business program, uh, at least from what I've seen thus far, that really wasn't the result of competition. That seemed to be a result of the pressure that you're feeling from investigations, from lawsuits, not competition. It is the result of, of uh, feeling like we should do something from a COVID point of view, and then electing to, instead of doing something very temporary, just do something permanent. And of course, we had those things, the lawsuits and all the rest of the stuff in the back of my head. But the thing that triggered it was, we were very worried about small business. Okay, but it wasn't competition. It was competition after we did ours to 15. It was competition that made Google drop theirs to 15. You can tell the... I, I understand perhaps that, that Google did, you know, that Google changed its price, but your action wasn't the result of competition. It was the result of feeling like we should do something for small business, which in our, which our, in our vernacular is a small developer. So when other stores reduced their price, and reduced their price, you felt no pressure, right, to reduce your price. I'm not familiar with Spain and, and, their, and their financial model. There's, one of the things that's missed here, I think, is there's a huge competition for developers. So it's just not the competition with the user side, it's also with the developer side in addition to the users. You can imagine if, if we had a, a above market uh, kind of uh, commission, people just wouldn't develop for us. Well, let's, let's talk about developers. I've seen evidence 
in the record uh, that did a survey of development. I, I'm going to I'm going to share with you the the results of this bar graph that was presented to me. I don't know how accurate it is because I looked for the source document and couldn't find it. But this survey indicated that 9% of developers were either very dissatisfied or somewhat dissatisfied with um, Apple's distribution services. 36% somewhat satisfied or very satisfied, and 19% didn't go either way, they're in the middle. So with 39% of all your developers dissatisfied, how is that acceptable and how is it, assuming those numbers are true, how is it that you're, uh, again, feeling any motivation or incentive to address their needs. I'm not familiar with the document that you're referencing, and so it's hard to, to uh, comment on certain specifics. But keep in mind that on a weekly basis, we're rejecting 40%. And so there's definitely some friction in the system, but this friction is what produces a curated experience for users that they love and it can go somewhere and be, be assured that it's safe and trusted. So sometimes the, the developer and the user are, are not necessarily in the interest of inter intersect. And we always live on the user. To, it doesn't seem to me that you feel, again, uh, real pressure or competition uh, to actually change the manner in which you act to address the concerns of the developers. Again, if these numbers are right. Yeah, I would, I would uh, look at it a very different way. We turn the place upside down for developers. You, you could probably look at a complaint that I might get and look at the amount of time it takes to, for a change to be made in the company. It's amazing, actually. Do you, uh, we've seen a number of profit and loss statements. Do you have, and again, you see the 100 binders behind me. Um, I don't recall seeing any other surveys or any other business records um, showing uh, that you routinely uh, conduct um, surveys regarding developer satisfaction and that you, in fact, move or make changes. I take with a grain of salt each side's anecdotal um, evidence. What I'm looking for are aggregates. Do you do that? I don't know if we do that. That would be something that Phil would know. Well, you certainly, as a CEO, then don't receive regular reports on that. That's correct. Okay. Uh, before we move into closed session, Ms. May, any questions on my questions? Well, just a couple of them. Mr. Cook, are developers allowed to sell their services, the things that they offer in apps outside? the app on the app store to consumers. Yes. And are developers allowed to make those offerings at lower prices than those that are offered on the app on the app store? Yes. And are developers allowed to communicate with their customers about those lower price offerings? Yes. Are consumers allowed to purchase outside the app store content at lower prices that they can then use on the app store. Yes. Um, does Apple continue to provide services to developers 
after an app is first published. Yeah. Can you describe the nature of the process? Well, they're, they're constantly doing updates to apps, and so the app review is not a done, one and done kind of thing. There's a continual kind of process. Also, the APIs, the APIs that they're using and that they're creating each year uh, is a massive effort. Developer tools is another one. These things are under constant improvement. Are you aware as to whether or not game developers in particular benefit from innovations and new offerings of APIs by Apple? Yes, of course, significantly. Thank you. Nothing else, Ronnie. No question, Jim. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you listening, we will be moving into closed session here. Um, as is normal, we will take our second break at 1235. So I do not know um, whether we will be back on to our public record uh, before that break. So just an FYI. At this point, we'll move into closed session. And that the media uh, will please need to leave the courtroom. Uh, Ms. Manifold, you're uh, entitled to stay. I would ask the courtroom deputy to uh, mute or turn off the lines, the you know, public access lines. You have been added to the waiting room. You cannot talk or listen until the host admits you to the meeting.
See you guys, closing session, time to order. Enjoyed your leisurely lunch. We are back on the record. The record will reflect that the parties are present. Witness back, Mr. Rubin? Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Rubin, I'll just remind you, sir, that you remain under oath. Okay, Mr. Byers? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed with your examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Rubin, good to see you again today. Um, you provided an opinion about the security of Apple's in-app payment processing system in your written direct testimony. Is that right? Yes. I, I don't recall you testifying to that orally yesterday. Is that, is that correct? It's in my written direct, but it wasn't in my oral. Okay, thank you. Um, and one reason you believe that Apple's payment system is more secure is that introducing other options would limit the amount of data that Apple can aggregate and analyze overall. Isn't that right? Yes. Now, uh, you may have heard evidence that there are uh, physical goods being sold on uh, through Apple devices, right? That's correct. Within the iPhone, right? Yes. And there are various other ways in which people can make purchases of these physical goods on the iPhone, right? Other than IAP. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, you have not uh, analyzed the relative transaction volume of these other payment processors that can be used to conduct the purchases of physical goods, have you? I have not. So you have not compared the data that might be collected by those payment processors to Apple's IAP system, right? That's correct. Um, for example, you haven't looked at the volume of transactions that might be handled by somebody like PayPal, right? That's correct. But you understand that PayPal may be used to conduct physical transactions on iOS, right? Transactions for physical goods. Yes. That's correct, right? Yes. And PayPal can be used off iOS, right? What do you mean by that? PayPal can be used in other places other than Apple's iOS operating system, right? Yes. Okay, it could be used on websites through a PC, right? Yeah. It could be used uh, in a browser on iOS, right? It can be. Now, you haven't assessed the security of any other alternative payment processing system other than IAP, right? I, I, not in this case, I haven't. Okay. Uh, you haven't offered testimony about that, right? Right. Okay. And, and you're not going to offer an opinion about that in this case, are you? I am not. Okay. Um, and you also haven't analyzed whether Epic's payment solution is a secure payment method, right? I did not look into that. Okay. Um, now, it would be possible to analyze whether any of these payment methods were compliant with something called the PCI standard. Isn't that right? Yes. And uh, the PCI standard provides a uniform baseline for how payment information is protected by these payment systems, correct? That's right. Uh, now, I saw in your report, though not in your testimony, that you've offered the opinion that one of the benefits of IAP is that it provides a frictionless experience. Isn't that right? Yes. Uh, specifically, it provides a frictionless experience to customers, right? That's right. And by frictionless, you mean uh, that it minimizes the amount of effort that a consumer has to put in in order to make a purchase, right? That's correct. And uh, when I asked you to deposition how you understood or how, how you came to that understanding of that term, you said that Mr. Tristan Kosminka, the head of Apple, you told you about that term, right? It was one of the Apple engineers. Uh, it may have been him. Okay. Um, but you have not evaluated other payment systems and whether they might cause friction when customers make transactions using them, right? I did not. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you about something in your written direct testimony. Um, you, you provided an opinion that Epic apparently explored the possibility of using the Enterprise program. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay, specifically you said that they explored uh, using the Enterprise system uh, to more conveniently distribute their apps 
essentially via side loading, right? It, that sounds like something I said. Okay. Um, and in fact, you provided the opinion that this consideration appeared to be financially motivated, didn't you? Um, can you point me to my report? I can. It's, uh, it's actually in your written direct testimony, paragraph 67. Yes. Okay. So is it correct that you gave the opinion that ethics consideration of this appeared to be financially motivated? That is correct. Okay. And then you refer to uh, two uh, defendants exhibits, which you'll agree were ethic internal documents? I believe so. Okay. And if you're going to, well, let me take a step back. Um, this is just your impression based on these documents, right? Uh, well, also based on other things that I heard in the case. Okay. In this written direct testimony, have you heard anything in this case? When you thought, when I'm you... sorry. I, I thought you were asking me my opinion now, and you're asking me about when I wrote this. Yes. Yes, that was what I was basing it on. Okay. You're purely interpreting the documents you cite in this paragraph, right? You are purely interpreting the documents you cited in this paragraph. Isn't that right? I'm sure that I also took into account other information uh, that I had heard in discussions. I'm, I'm not going to say that I had a complete blank slate when I read these documents. Okay, but you didn't cite anything else in this paragraph, right? That's correct. Okay, and did you look for other documents concerning the circumstances that you described here? I, I don't recall looking for other documents. Okay, and, but it would be important, you would agree, to give uh, an opinion based on a complete record of the situation, right? Yes. Okay, could I refer you please to DX4235? This is in our Blackboard binder. Are you on 4235? I think so. Yes, I am. Um, and you see that this is an email from Mr. Grant. It also involves others at Epic, including Mr. Sweeney. Do you see that? I do. And there's an extensive set of communications within this document among Epic employees, right? Yes. This, I have a redacted version here. Yes, that's right. Okay. And if you look at uh, .004 in this document. Okay. You see uh, about halfway down the page, there's a communication from Mr. Grant where he's describing the enterprise certificate that is provided by Apple under the enterprise program, right? I'm not sure where exactly to look for that. Sure. There's a communication that says August 30th, 2018 at 8.30 a.m., Andrew Grant wrote. Okay. Are you with me now? Yes. And he's describing uh, the fact that Epic has an enterprise certificate. I see that. Okay. And can you tell from this that they're describing, uh, sorry, that this communication relates to uh, Epic's use or potential use of the enterprise program? I, I don't remember all of the context around this, but it does look like he's talking about the enterprise program when he mentions an enterprise certificate. Okay, and then do you see uh, the communication from Mr. Sweeney, the one right above that, on August 30th, 2018, at 9.31 a.m.? Do you see that? Yes. Um, do you see that Mr. Sweeney wrote, adding Micah Thomas in, Mike is investigating what exactly the Apple terms say about all of it. Do you see that? I see that. Uh, he then writes, the goal here isn't some scheme to siphon money away from the iOS app store, but to find a way to truly treat iOS as an open platform. You see that? I see that. If you didn't consider this when you gave the opinion that uh, Epic's uh, contemplation or consideration of the enterprise program appeared to be financially motivated? I, I think I that this supports that. Uh, you believe the statement that the, the – uh, a point is not to siphon away money from the iOS app store supports your conclusion 
that it was financially motivated. But the, the rest of the sentence where it says to truly treat iOS as an open platform, iOS is not an open platform, and so they're trying to avoid paying the commissions is how I understand why they wanted to do this. Okay, that's just your understanding of this document, right? That's just your interpretation of this document. Based on what I understood about the case, yeah. Okay, and your, under your understanding is that uh, your role as a computer security expert is not to describe motivations to people in the case? As a computer scientist uh, and a professor, I think that sometimes when you look at the adversarial model, you sure, take care sure, of motivation. I'm just, I'm just asking, do you understand that your role in the case is not to describe motivations to people in the case? That's not my primary role. Is that any of your role? I use motivations as part of this answer the question. I think it, it's part of looking at a security analysis, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just ask you again, though. You're doing nothing more than looking at the document in front of you, right? I mean, I based it on my understanding of what was happening in the case in this document. Okay, thank you. Do you want 4235 in evidence? I do, Your Honor. No objection? No objection. Okay. All right. Redirect. 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 Dr. Lubin, uh, you were just asked about uh, paragraph 67 of your written direct testimony, and the question was posed to you, um, what was your basis for reaching the, uh, an assumption that EPIC was looking to the enterprise program in order to save money? Was there anything in the documents other than what you just talked about with counsel that specifically related to uh, Epic's motivation in that regard, or that informed you as to Epic's motivations. Yes, I, I cited page two of the document specifically, um, but I've now closed my binder, so I'm going to have to find it again. What was the exhibit number? Uh, well, we can we can take a look at 4066. So the back can ask Mr. Elkees to put that up. BX 4066. I believe that will also be in the binder that Mr. Byers gave to you. And let's go to the last page of this document, Mr. O'Keefe. And at the very bottom. So, so first, um, Dr. Rubin, do you recognize that this is 4066, which is the document that you are citing to in paragraph 67 of your written direct? Yeah, this is dot zero zero two which is what i cited right and is there anything on this page um that you looked at in order to discern whether epic's motivation in looking at the enterprise certificate was to save money yes and what is it so we see here uh also if we're looking at ways to reduce the 30 percent cut that apple takes then we should consider what either removing all purchases from within the app might look like or whether the subscription model drops to a 15% cut after year one could be interesting. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Your Honor, no further questions. Anything uh, back on that topic? No. Dr. Rubin, do you know whether Epic actually used the enterprise program in the way you have opined about? I, just from what I heard in the trial. Okay. Um, and you understand that Mr. Grant works for Mr. Sweeney, right? Yes. You understand the document I showed you is after the document that Council for Apple showed you? I don't. Okay. And you didn't cite the document I showed you in any of your testimony reports, right? I did not. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. No, no further questions. Anything on that topic? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, sir. You are excused. You may step down. <laughs> Ms. Forrest. Do each of you rest pending resolution of exhibits? Yes, Your Honor. Epic does rest. Yeah, we'll also rest, Your Honor, subject to the expert uh, report comment or expert testimony comment we made earlier. All right. Uh, so for the public, 
uh, he's not used to trials. That means that the evidentiary portion of this trial is now concluded. On Monday, uh, counsel have agreed to have a uh, closing argument in a sense uh, by uh, discussing topics relative to uh, the evidence that has been submitted in the context of antitrust law uh, to assist the court in uh, my evaluation of the evidence and the arguments that are being made. As I've said before, uh, I have a considerable amount of evidence to uh, review in, in more detail uh, than just being uh, hearing it during trial and then doing um, the legal analysis in that, in that framework of the evidence and what evidence is persuasive versus what evidence is not. Uh, that will take some time. And my decision will be in writing uh, when it's all said and done. I am picking a jury on June 7th. So while I'm in trial, I obviously won't be working on this case. Um, but I am uh, not one to let things uh, Sit around. I think it's important to try to get these things resolved while everything is still fresh. And so I will work hard uh, to try to get you a decision as soon as is reasonably possible, but no promises as to exact dates. Um, hopefully before August 13th, but you never know. That was a little joke. Just a little one. All right. Uh, at this point, I do want to make sure uh, this is going to be tedious, so those of you who are listening in may not want to listen anymore, but I do want to go through so that I make sure I have all of the exhibits. Uh, I spent some time on this last night. I have someone from each side, and we can go through these, and then we'll stand in recess for the day once we do that, unless there's something else. Ms. Forrest, anything else on your side? Nothing else. Uh, apart from the uh, exhibits, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything else from your side? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Counsel, if you will, once the mics are up, if you will state your appearances for the record. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jessica Choi for Epic. Ms. Choi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. This is Howard Phillips for Apple. Okay, Mr. Phillips, good afternoon. All right, I will do this numerically, and we do it in 100 series, okay? So in the first 100 series, what I show is the following. Admitted into evidence, 6, 8, 9, 30, 41, 42, 43, 46, 47, 48, 52, 56, 3, 61, 63, 64, 66, 72, 79, 80, 89, 98, and 99. Ms. Troy, anything else? Um, I did not have um, eight on my list. We did not have eight on our list either. Okay. Your Honor, I'll just, um, if you wouldn't mind reading those again, I took a, took a, took a second to uh, find where uh, you were reading from. So, um, apologies okay. for that. I'll do it one more time. Uh, if uh, you all, Ms. Stone, do you show eight by any chance? So, no. Okay, so I will um, remove that from my list. All right, one more time. Are you with me, Mr. Phillips? I am. Six, nine, 30, 41, 42, 43, 46, 47, 48, 52, 56, 57, 58, 59, 
Sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-six, seventy-two, seventy-nine, eighty, eighty-nine, ninety-eight, and ninety-nine. All right. Anything, Mr. Phillips? Anything you see? No, 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 no nothing there. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Eight hundred and sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-five, eight hundred and seventy-four through eight seventy-two, eight hundred and seventy-four through seventy-seven, eight seventy-nine through eight eighty-three, eight eighty-six, eighty-eight, ninety, ninety-two, ninety-seven, and ninety-eight. That's everything, Patrick. Yes. Um, lines up here as well. Okay. The 1,000 series, 1,000 through 1,012, 1,017, 1,022 through 27, 1,030, 32, 34 through 37. 1,045, 47, 49, 50, 54 through 57, 59, 61, 66, 69, 70, 1,074 through 80, 1,000, 84 through 92. Everything for Apple. Yep, everything for Apple as well. Okay, moving to the 1100 series. 1164, 65, 82, and 83. Everything for Apple. Everything here as well. Uh, 1,220, that's the only one in that series. Correct. Yep, we got that one. Uh, from today, there are three in the 1,600 series, so 1,677, 78, and 67. Correct. So could you just read those, those ones again, Your Honor? Sorry. Sure. Uh, chronologically, then, 1,667, 1,677, and 78. I'm not seeing, oh yes, there you go, 78, got them all, thanks. Yep, that was from today. Also from today, 1701, 1703, 09, 14, 21, and 25. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple as well. 1800 series, 1813, 1815, 1817 and 1818, 1849, 1854 to 56, 1883, 91, 93 through 97 and 99. 1890, Your Honor. Yeah, we had 1890. All right, I'll add that, 1890. 1901, 1906 through 1910, 1913 through 19, 42, 1947 through 50, and 1978. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple as well. Okay, moving to the 2000 series, 2001, 2017, 2029, 2031, 48, 52, 57, 60, 62, 65, and then I think I'm, I, I have question marks on 63 and 66. Do you show either of those? You don't have those on my list. 
No, we don't have those either. Um, we do have 2016 on our list. Okay, let me let me finish. I have four more. So I have 2076, 84, 90, and 93. You have 2016? I have 2060. Oh, 60? Correct. That one I do have already. Mr. Phillips, what do you mean? You said you had another one? Yeah, we have 2016 as well. Um, 2016, 2016. I do not have um, 2016. I didn't show 2016 either. Just, um, Okay. I believe it went in with Mr. Fisher, Your Honor. All right. 2016 is admitted. Okay. Uh, anything else? I put Your Honor. Nothing else. 2100 series and 2109. 21, 16, 18, 21, 23, 25, 26, 42, 73, 74, 76, 21, 85, 89, 90, 94, and 97. That's everything correct. Hold on. 2200 series, 2202, 17, 18, 35, 73, 74, 80, 84, and 96. I had a question mark on 81. I think does not have 81 on the list. You have, a, you have a question mark on 81 as well. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it was. Okay. So that's not admitted. Uh, 2300 series. 2300, 2302, 03, 09, 11, 23, 25, 26, 28, 23, 33, 37, 38, 50, 56, 62, 65, 66, 67, 71, 74, 78, 85, 86, and then 89 through 92. I think 2316 on my list. And we also have uh, 2316. Okay, I'll have that. 2400 series, 2421, 35, 50, 51, 52, 55, 258, 63, 69, 76, and 77. Everything graphic. We have all those, so. Okay. 2500 series. 2500, 08, 19, 29, 31, 34, 35, 45, 47, 57, 58, 67 through 70, 75 through 79, 81 through 85, 87, through 91, 98, and 99. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple. 2600 series, 2600 through 2603, 26, 
18, 19, 21, 22, 24, and 68. Everything for Epic. Everything for Apple as well. 2700 series, 2756, 76 through 78, 27, 83, and 90. Everything for Epic. Everything for Apple. 2,828, I'm sorry, strike, strike that, 2,826, and 2,882. Everything perfect. Everything perfect. 2,943, 46, 51, 52, and 53. Everything perfect. Everything perfect. 3,000 series, 3,052. 55, 60, 7 through 69, 72, 77, 83, 84, 84A, 498. Everything's epic. 94 and 98. Mr. Phillips? Yes, yes, uh, everything's happy as well. Okay, 3,100 series, 3,115, 20, 22, 24, 25, 29, 31, 33, 34, 38, 40, 44, 50, 52, 61, 66, 74, 79, 73, oh, strike that, 93, 97, 98, and 99. Your Honor, Epic has 3176 and 3177 in the list. We have 3177 on the list. Do you have a, a date? I had a 77 and then I had I had it scratched off. Um, there were some withdrawals. I don't know. If that uh, 3177 was entered um, yesterday as part of the, um, the stipulation at docket 682. Okay, so 3177. That one in with Mr. Scholler, Your Honor. Yeah, I'm seeing that here. Someone has 3176. Yeah, that, that's that's not in. That was in Ruben Belt materials, and he's he's been withdrawn, so that one should be withdrawn. Okay. So we believe 3177 went in with uh, Mr. Malkowski. Right, I saw that. Okay. So 3177 is in. 3176 is not. Okay, uh, 3200 series. Okay, 3202, 16, 21, 22, 54, 55, 56, 58, 69, 87, 93, 97, 98. Everything for Apple. And everything for Apple as well. 3300 series, 3308, 17, 24, 28, 32, 43, 59, 63, 64, 70, 90, 93, and 99. Epic does not have 70 on the list. We do have 70. Um, we apparently came in with Mr. Markowski yesterday. I'm sure. 
I sure came in on the 19th. Okay, so that's in 3,400 51, 53, 56, 57, 60, 62, 63, 64, 65, 67, 68, 72, 73, 78, 91, 94. It's everything for Epic. Everything for Epic as well. 3,500, 3,505, Everything for Apple. Uh, 3600 series, 3606, 16, 20, 29, 32, 36, 39, 41, 42, 50, 50, 59, 60, 61, 64, 76, 81, 84, 91, 95, 96. We also have um, 3679. Okay, I have that as well. Okay, I had that one, and again, I crossed that off. That is, it looked like it was withdrawn. I don't know if that one is. Well, let me just check. Uh, we have that associated with uh, Professor Rubenfeld also. I show it as Ruben in there. Yeah, we have it as Ruben. So, um, in docket, uh, well, maybe both of you used it, that's why. In docket 641, it shows 3679 withdrawn. I think this may have been a mistake. Apparently, it was uh, on a stipulation for Professor Rubin and Rubenfeld. Hmm. I don't have it in my binder for Professor Rubin, so I'm not sure if they meant to associate it with him or not. We do know it was associated with, with Mr. Uh, Professor Rubenfeld, so it should be withdrawn if it was his document. Well, with all due respect to counsel's binder. Well, it's been, um, so, so Mr., I don't know if it matters, but Mr. Dorn, I did, I did show it as withdrawn through your stipulation. Ah, thank you, Your Honor. That's, that's why I had it and then crossed it off. Yeah, I, I know too. It's the App Store review guidelines, so uh, there's probably not too much room for debate. So I think it's in uh, elsewhere as well. While well, we're just uh, checking numbers, I've been asked to confirm that uh, 3305 is admitted. I, I think we did cover that one, but that so, so again, sure. that one I had in, and then it was withdrawn. So I did not. Reference that one. So in docket 641, on page 4 of 7, there are a series of 8, 9, um, there, there are a series, all of the Rubenfeld ones were with 
drawn. So what I don't know is whether whether these came in with other people, but when it said withdrawn, I deleted them. Your Honor, um, the notes I'm receiving say that it went in with the final expert step um, related to Ruben. I'm sorry, what number are we on now? Oh, we're still on 3679. If it's just the after ye guidelines, I'm sure that there's no objection to that. Okay. Thank you, Council. Going back to 3305, you show that it was actually made with uh, Mr. Malkowski during his direct on the 20th. So it may have been withdrawn and then later admitted to, to our witness. Okay, so 3305 is in. Uh, all right, 3500 series. 3505. Thank you, Francis. So I'm at 3,700. 3,706, 09, 10, 12, 24, 32, 33, 43, 46, 50, 56, 58, 60, 64, 65, 68, 74, 77, 78, 81, 82, and 96. Uh, I also have 3795. I think does not have 3795. And with uh, Mr. Allison. What is he doing oh. with day? Can you give me a day? Uh, maybe the seventh. I have an ID on, uh, on the seventh. Uh, and now I read more closely, I see it was just ID. So okay. uh, apologies for the confusion there. Uh, I think that's 3743. Yes. I do have. Oh, okay. Maybe I also have that one. Okay. 3,800. Uh, 67, 77, and 79. 17, okay. Everything for Apple. 3,900 series, 3,900 itself, 3,901, 05, 06, 13, 17, 18, 22, 32, 33, 38, 43, 50, 51, 55, 61, 68, 86, 89, and 93. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple. 4,000 series, 4,002, 10, 11, 13, 15, 18, 22, 24, 28, 36, 63, 66, 69, 72, 74. A question for me on 78, 80, 88, 89, 89A, 94, 96. So do you all show 78? I do not have 78 on my list. I don't have 78 either. All right, so not 78. Okay. Otherwise, we're good, Ms. Troy. That's everything for us. Could you, sorry, Ron, could you say uh, 40, the one with the A at the end of it, is that um, 4089A? Yeah, 4089A. And did that current with Mr. Cook today? Yes. Yep, we have that one. Okay. 4100 series, 41, 14, 15, and 16, 
19, 20, and 21. 28, 31, 33, 36, 38, 40, 54, 62, 67, 68, 70, 72, 74, 77, 78, 92, and 99. That's exactly. Forty-two hundred series. Forty-two hundred itself. Seventeen, nineteen, thirty-four, thirty-nine, forty-nine, seventy, seventy-five, seventy-eight, eighty-two, eighty-five, and eighty-seven. It's thirty-one on our next list. Yeah, thirty-one is on our list as well. Uh, I must have missed it, but yes, I have that. I show 31. Okay. 4300 series. 4301, 03, 04, 08, 10, 12, 22, 25, 29, 33, 35, 44, 48, 56, 61, 62, 63, 71, 74, 76, 84, 89, 99. Your Honor, I have 25 and 27. Apologies if I missed it. I show 25. I don't show 27. We don't have 27. We do have 25. I have the date admitted date of May 19th for Schmidt draft examination. Yeah, I don't show that admitted, Ms. Stone. So it's 43.27. That's your honor. Anybody? Is there an objection? I don't even know what it is. To BPLA, your honor. No objection. Okay. 4327 is admitted. 4,400 series, uh, 4,400 itself, 01, 03, 07, 11, 19, 24, 25, 33, 34, 35, 47, 49, 51, 57, 63, 68, 69, 77, 80, 88, 89, a question on 93, 95, 96, 97, and 99. That's everything for Epic, and I do have 93 on my list. Yeah, we have 93 as well. Okay. 4,500 series, 4,519, 21. 26, 30, 55, 58, 61, 64, 66, 69, 79, 81, 86, and 95. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple. 4,600 series, 4,600 itself, 4,608, 4,610. 14, 16, 19, 23, 26, 27, 32, 37, 38, 41, 49, 50, 52, 61, 62, 63, 65, 69, 71, 72, 74, 79 and 80. 
Everything's Apple. Yep, everything's Apple. 4,700 series. 4,713 through 16. 4,753, 3, 61, 63, 65, uh, 66, 67, 69, 70, and 71, 73, 86, 87, 92, uh, through 98, but I do have a question on 97. It's everything for Apple, and I do have 97 on the list. We have 97 on the list as well. Um, 4775 was actually withdrawn as an exhibit um, at docket 704. Okay, so I'll take out 75. Yes, Mr. Schroeder. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, 4,800 series, 0203-06-13, 48-15-19, 22-24, 55-59, 61, 66, 68, 71, 72, 75, and 78. Uh, I have 876 on the list. Maybe we have 876 as well. 4876? Correct. Yes. And we also have 4880. I have to have that as well. All right, so I'll add 76 and 80. 4,900. Uh, 4,909, 18, 76, 59, 62, 66, 69, 75, 76, and 82. Everything for Apple. Everything for Apple. Then we jump to 5,300. Is that right? Correct. Yep. 53, 22, 26. I have a question mark on 32. Do either of you show that? I do not have 32 on the list. We do not have 32 either. Okay, take that. Uh, uh, 53, 35, and 63. If it has 38 on the list? So we do not have 38 on the list. We do not. So what, where do you show that one from? I have this um, as part of the I admit it on May 20th as part of the uh, law firm paying materials relied upon. So that's from a stipulation? Correct. Packet number 715. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see it. Um, is there an agreement on this one? So what was the biggest? 5338. Yeah, we're seeing that on the stipulation as well. So um, yeah, you should have it on our list and no, no objection. Okay. 5338. Uh, 5400 series. 5441, 67, 69, 71, excuse me, through 88. And 92. That's everything for Apple. That's everything for Apple. 
Diane, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, uh, 5500 <clears throat> 5, series, 5505, 18, 23, 32, 35, 36, 39, 40, 41, 42, 44, 46 through 50, 52, 55 through 62, 67, 68, and 73. I think it has 5527 on the list. And 5627. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. Yeah. At 5527. So, where do you show that from? I have that um, admitted on May 17th during Mr. Schiller's testimony. I have a, I have a fifty six twenty seven, but I don't have fifty five twenty seven. Your Honor, we're checking the transcript. Perhaps we can come back to that one in, in a moment. Well, the final one of the day, 5627. Yep. 5527. I have, I, I have 5627. That's, that's, that's right, Your Honor. I, I, we just searched the transcript for 5527, so that might have been a typo. We do have 5627. And I just need to check 5627. That, that was the one I admitted on the 17th. We got that one. Good. Okay. Um, 5527. Okay. Hooray. We're done with Really important. I tell you, I cringed when I read about, I think it was the judge in Chicago and all the, the exhibits that went back to the jury were wrong. Mm -hmm. We had to retry the entire case. It was a patent case, I think. So I am a little bit neurotic about exhibits. I'm the, I'm the subject of that, Your Honor. I just want to check one, sure. one final exhibit, if you'll indulge us. Um, PX1659, which came up during Mr. Cook's testimony today. Um, uh, we do not have that as exhibit, as admitted, and I just want to confirm. Um, confirm that. Uh, you know, I didn't have the spreadsheet for that one. Hold on. So I show from today three in the 1600 series. 1667, 77, and 78. Yeah. You can read up those. And so what were you asking about? Yes, and I was just, we, we do not think that was a next one. I just wanted to check. I, 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 I think I missed it when you were going through that theory. So I, I did not check. call out that one. I think we're all uh, we're on the same page then. Thank you. The only thing I show on, that's okay. That's why we're doing it. Uh, okay. Could I ask, um, each side it seems to me is going to, it will have to have a file with all the admitted exhibits in any event. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a flash drive with those electronic exhibits, maybe sometime. Monday or Tuesday. We'll do that, Your Honor. I assume you don't want another physical set. No, I don't. 
Okay, you, you now after how many weeks would you know that? I I, I am. Yeah, I really don't. <laughs> I, I tried really hard to make this work, but it just didn't work. So. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify, you would like all the exhibits. Uh, in whatever form. I'm in. happy to have two flash drives, one from each of you with respect to your admitted set. Okay. Uh, that we've just gone through in excruciating detail. Very important though, really important. So Ms. Stone, you now have the list. If there's, if we don't have a file number with them, just let us, um, let us know. They should have been delivering to you yeah. physical copies. So we'll we'll verify. Okay, we'll verify that so that we have that for any appeal. Uh, okay. Well, I really, um, as I said, I, I really do wish I could have joked around a little bit more with you all during the course of this trial, but uh, so many people listening, I really thought it was important to make sure that they understood how serious the process this is. But um, they're all uh, excellent trial lawyers. It's been really a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have good trial lawyers in the courtroom. And believe me, I don't always get good trial lawyers in the courtroom. So um, I appreciate that. I look forward to Monday. It should be fun. And is there anything else we need to do? Uh, Uh, I'm happy to start a little bit later at nine, if you want. Whatever time your honor would like is fine with us. The same, of course, your honor. Well, I guess everybody is listening is used to our normal schedule, so we'll go ahead and do our normal schedule. Well, your honor, um, I've just got a note that I guess um, Exhibit BX5338 was withdrawn by uh, stipulation uh, 682, docket number 682. 5338. 5338. Okay, I'll try that. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else? That's all I have. Nothing else, nothing, Your Honor. Okay, everybody have a good weekend. We'll stand in recess until we get back on Monday morning. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.